welcome everybody to a brand new episode of James D Podcast, where we spit the damn spill the tea. And today we're coming at you with a new main episode where we review two new records that have recently been released. This week we are going to be talking about the new record from the long, long silent, but now he has returned. Mr. Little Ugly Mane has come back with volcanic bird enemy and the voiced concern i wow. did not have that written down I- i'm stunned that you nailed that I, I, I will say the funny thing is i posted like the album cover to twitter and someone was like that's not real and i'm like it absolutely <laughs> is a real album I'd be like this is five nights at freddy's and it's just like they, th- oh, they well. were like this is a fake album someone would make to make fun of pitchfork and i'm like no it's real and it's good <laughs> But we are also discussing another album today, Jake. The world is a beautiful place. I'm no longer afraid to die. Their follow-up to their last record. Fucking, what the fuck was that album called? Nobody liked it. Always Foreign. (laughs) Always Foreign. It's a good album. album. Always Foreign. But now they have come back with Illusory Walls. And we're going to talk about those two records. Also, this week, we are going to be talking about Julia Holter's album, Aviary, for Morgan's Record Club, which... That's a discussion and a half, and that's a fucking, that's an album. That's an album. That's an album. And we're doing the 1991 retrospective where we cover Teenage Fan Club's bandwagon-esque. Uh, August actually is joining us for that episode, so uh, he, he the, the return of the boy. Yeah. And of course, speaking of returns and people showing up on this podcast, we once again are thrilled to show that we have adequate Emily joining us for this week in August's Jeez. stead. Yes. As we're thrilled to, have, thrilled to have Emily back again. Emily, you're starting to be like a regular at this point, basically. It went from like well, a, I, I want to reach the point where even though I'm a guest, I'm someone's favorite member of the podcast. <laughs> Honestly, I don't think it'll take long. Uh, you probably already are. Um, yeah, we fucking suck. It was like what? <laughs> it was like three months between your first two appearances, and then like now it's been like a month since the last one so yeah it's it's music be good and emily be having opinions on music when she can find the god awful time to listen to it um i i'll just like listen to someone and be like how have you not listened to that album before and i'm just like my brain is mush yeah it, like my brain my brain looks like Guernica, like the fucking Pablo Picasso <laughs> painting. Like it just, it's just misery and death and chaos everywhere. And then I'll just my be like, oh like yeah, Guernica I've never heard Led like Zeppelin too. And then title. I'll listen to that. Yes. So we've had a lot of cool shit go up on the channel this week that we just want to quickly shout out yes. for anyone who may have missed it. Um, last week, uh, Jake put out a really funny video of him and his girlfriend Ree watching Twilight and that was that's one of the funniest videos that's ever gone up on this channel frankly it, it's um, an, a, a return to film content that hopefully there'll be more of in the future to come as well oh we, um, gay we have recorded New Moon <laughs> you've done one for New Moon okay so you're, you're gonna yeah, do the whole, we're, gonna do, we're determined you're gonna do all five okay amazing uh-huh. Uh, and also, I've never seen any of the Twilight movies before that either. No, oh, she's wow. completely unfamiliar. Okay, well, yeah. So that happened. Uh, we also, <laughs> Jake also put up a video where he ranked the discography of one Chelsea Wolf, which you should check out as well. A really, really good video that went up the other day. And we have... She's coming out with a new record. Yeah, and she's coming out with, with a new Converge. record. With Converge in about a month's time, so we'll be reviewing that. She's not even a real wolf, though. <laughs> Shout out to my furries. What do you know about it? <laughs> Where's your proof? Morgan, there's something you want to tell us? Um, the first time I don't spoken. <laughs> also up this uh, week is a, a fantastic new episode of the Rubber Gum Anime Podcast. So we're doing, we're not just doing music. We're doing anime. We're doing movies. We're doing other inferior forms of art as well. So the content train ain't got no breaks, well, baby. Jake and August. It's an- Jake and August did a fantastic episode of Rubber Gum with their esteemed friend Jen on the third Hello, Kentucky Venmo. On the third uh, Evangelion reboot movie, I believe. Fourth. fourth? The fourth, fourth. The newest. 3.0 and plus 1.0. Final. And uh, yeah, I mean, 3.0 what? plus 1.0 thrice upon a time. Thanks, Hideaki Anno. And if you want to hear 
uh, three people absolutely despairing at <laughs> that one of the worst pieces of art of the year, as far as I can tell. Then and talk out. about Angel Anaconda at some point. Anyway, um, yes. Might as well shout out, since she's here, that Emily has obviously been working on a lot of shit. Emily, do you want to shout out what you've been doing lately? Uh, yes. Uh, I So last time I was on the podcast, right after I finished it, I finished recording and I've since released the video for my video essay, Monkeys, oh, sorry, Head the Monkeys in Fabrication. Well, I'm a fake fan of my own stuff. I can't even remember the title. And it's... So no hit. God damn it. <laughs> so many people oh, dear. kept saying that. I got a comment from Woolhat101, and I'm like, I forgot there's this really small teenage monkeys fandom on like Tumblr. <laughs> of course there is. A teenage monkeys fandom. I love their album Bandwagon esque. And, uh, but yeah, it's my favorite video I've done yet. Uh, as I think I showed off last time, mm. I made a tripod. You did. For a, yes. a teleprompter holder upper. Um, this is really unstable and it knocked over several times while I was recording. Relatable. And what? I, I am also really unstable and known to fall down sometimes when you're recording. And also a tripod. <laughs> yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's I don't like, how to respond to that. It's a tripod. Massive it's a mini tripod that I use 20 zip ties and tied. <laughs> I can't read that. All right. Well, now we'll move to our main segment before our reviews, which is what we've been listening to over the past seven days or as of late, in the case of Emily. Jake, what have you been listening to? Well, uh, I'll start this out with an album that I think Tyler will be very pleased that I listened to. I listened to an album that he has been talking about for a very long time, from a band he's been talking about being a fan of for a very long time, that being the Afghan Wigs Black Love, which, fuck me, terrific album. Um, the, the, uh, I, the only way I could describe the appeal of this album while listening to it was I was just like, if your favorite Smashing Pumpkins album is a door, this is an album for you. I can't really point out to why I, th I thought that, but I did. Uh, not that that album reminds me of Smashing Pumpkins, really. I mean, yes, kind of. But Point being, that's just a fucking terrific rock album. I mean, my God. I, I As someone who is completely unfamiliar with it, I just listened to it just because Tyler was a fan of their album, uh, Black Love and Gentlemen. He has talked about, like, I think, yeah. like, as far back as several months ago. Amazing um, album, both of them. It. And the writing is just fucking terrific. It's also, uh, it's not, 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 a, not a cheery listen, um, bleak. but also- It's very bleak. Yes. Very. Um, I mean, there's just literally some songs on there that are just like, hey, you ever just want to sit on some fucking train tracks and fucking let the train run over you? And it's just like, all right, all right, calm down. Uh, but yeah, it's an amazing kind of darker, grungier rock record. And it has like, so it already has so much room to grow, even though I think it's utterly yeah. fantastic. And I just, I have to listen to all of their albums now. I you have, have to. to, you definitely have to listen to Gentlemen. The way I mm. pitch it is that it's like um, Alice in Chains by way of Sunny Day Real Estate. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a like great way sunny to day. It. But it's also oh, like the, the, the singer is also like kind of, not great at singing but also like he doesn't have a conventionally very good voice but he yeah. uses his voice in really powerful ways and oh he's a really commanding presence yeah um so yeah um, it's it's dope shit great band yeah it's an amazing you album. can't see i, I you really can't see it. it but i i emoted when you said <laughs> allison chains by way of sunny day real estate yeah that, that was deliberately yeah. like a little bit i mean i do i have said that multiple times about this band but that is was deliberately for you morgan bait oh yeah this is easily a band that morgan like if if anything you'll like it more than me which i i hit that with like a nine after a first listen so yeah um i also continued uh my journey i'm preparing on doing a ranked video for one of my favorite bands one of the most significant bands in all of rock music of course uh, black sabbath 
Um, and I've officially gotten to the point where I listened to their last album of theirs that I didn't hear that's in, in that initial legendary six album run. I listened to volume four, um, which is probably my least favorite of those six albums. And that being said, it's fucking awesome. Uh, terrific album, uh, Changes is one of the greatest fucking songs I've ever fucking heard in my fucking life. Um, Wheels of Confusion is one of the best album openers uh, they've ever had. And if not for the weird minute and a half long tracks that they throw into their albums that are completely superfluous, I would probably bump it up a little bit. But uh, it's a great album. Uh, and then after that, I listened to the first album outside of that, which they're sort of noted for being like, after that, those first six albums, there's a couple records between when uh, uh, Ronnie Dio joined the band that are a little bit rough. Uh, first of which being Technical Ecstasy. Um, and this album is fascinating and weird, and it's not great, but it's not bad. Like, I, I narrowly think that it's good, and a lot of it, too, is the that I just so happen to have listened to the very, very recent 2021 remaster of it. Do not listen to a version of the album that is not the 2021 remaster because Ozzy's vocals on this album are processed. They are like, they're both double tracked and reverbed in such a way that it just, it sounds fucking awful. Just, just terrible. They're just so adrift in the mix and they're somehow like, they're both barely audible and just like also nails on a chalkboard. And I love Ozzy as a vocalist. He's not like a traditionally great singer or anything, but he's got like a power in his voice that they utilize really, really well. But the remaster fixes that a little bit. And the thing with Technical Ecstasy is that this is basically the Tony Iommi power hour in that the guitar work and the soloing on this is better than it has ever been up until this point in the band's career. It's fucking excellent. In fact, this is them, like, on their previous two records, Sabotage and Sabbath Bloody Sabbath, it's them going in a distinctly more progressive direction. What I didn't expect is that they actually keep going in that direction on this album, because this is kind of Black Sabbath trying to be Rush, which is interesting. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds cool and awesome, and sometimes it is. Uh, <laughs> the two best songs on the album are called... Uh, gypsy and dirty woman so thanks for that guys um they're 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 they're, they're great songs um uh, uh stevie uh, nicks uh, ozzy is not no she is didn't she he is not um i all and, i can think about is oh god what am i thinking of china girl right uh yeah david bowie where you're like this song is kind of really good production wise but it's so fucking racist yeah it's exactly. so racist it's, and it's sad because it's like it's such a totemic high on the album and the rest of the songs are just like they're really like awkward and clumsy and they have these really strange melodies and like sometimes they they really just they they kind of nail the proggier edge that they've got and sometimes they just really don't but the thing is is that it's it's still very much overwhelmingly like it's it ne'er it goes into being good but it is a steep steep decline from what they were doing beforehand um i am not looking forward to never say die which is significantly lower rated than technical ecstasy and that is not even their uh least good record i am officially into the uh the the, the dark ages i am praying to god that uh the promise of heaven and hell and mob rules on the horizon will motivate me to get through them but uh i, I they got getting seven through... star and uh, forbidden <laughs> Yeah, um, not really looking forward to those. And not to mention Seventh Star is like, that was when the band was like going through so many different members and kicking so many other members out that it, like, it was they Black just Sabbath had... featuring Tommy Iommi. Yeah, legally they couldn't do just Black Sabbath. It had to be Tony Iommi, but um, going that'll through be interesting changes when I make indeed. <laughs> that was what I was trying to do. That's like... Uh-huh. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting album. I can't say that you'll even particularly like it, but I can't say that it's not worth hearing. Um, 
Also, I listened to a new release, which is, I heavily recommend this album. I mean, I heavily recommend it to everybody who enjoys any variety of heavy metal, but uh, it is the debut self-titled album from a German uh, heavy metal band that is really more along the lines of like, think Dark Throne by way of Judas Priest. Uh, the, the band is very much like, it's heavy metal, but like really, really punk inflected. Um, and like, and the, the vocalist definitely has like a black metal thing going on, but the, the instrumentation and production is very, very heavy metal. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, the, uh, the band and the album is Knife. Uh, and this album is 37 minutes long. It does not reinvent the wheel, but in terms of like heavy metal or whatever, uh, kind of like the Halloween record that we reviewed earlier this year and that it's just kind of like, it's, you know, kind of stays in its lane. That said, oh my God, this is so much fucking fun. It's, it's so like, it's, it's my exact brand of comfort music and that it's, you know, a bunch of younger dudes with guitars yelling about Satan and shit. Um, the songwriting though is so fucking hooky. It's so fucking catchy. I love the lead vocalist's voice. It's like the perfect amount of time that a record like this should be. And I want an, uh, I want bands like this who are clearly like, you know, they're, they're indebted to their influences, but I want a band like this to go and like get weirder and use this as a fundamental sort of fleshing out the, the, the core of their sound kind of record. It's, it's a really fun album. Uh, really great. Uh, it, nobody's listened to it. It's got like eight reviews on Rate Your Music. Uh, go go check it out if you think that it might be even remotely in your sphere. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Just looking today. at it, and they classified it as speed metal. It's really that's the thing with Rate Your Music tags, and that like first of all, nobody fucking knows what speed metal sounds like. It's not really, but like it definitely sounds like Judas Priest, and Judas Priest had a speed metal era, like Defenders of the Faith. But it doesn't really sound like Defenders of the Faith. It sounds like Painkiller. So, like, eh, like speed metal asking, is basically didn't sound a stone's like what you were throw describing. away from power metal. It's it's mostly the same thing, really. Um, uh, but other than that, uh, fucking oh, I to go right back on the two the fusion of the two last things that I just listened to um, is that I listened to the debut album from ghost this one because it was the 10th anniversary of opus eponymous and opus eponymous still fucking shreds um uh admittedly first half of the album is a little bit is a little tiny bit better just because it has like like all the fucking god tier songs or the front half of that album that said it also has like the the killer instrumental that ends that album as well as uh, something like Prime Mover, which, you know, all worth listening to, but damn, that is a terrific record. Uh, Conclave Con Dio is one of the best ghost songs, uh, and I might be talking about the best ghost songs in a video that could go up around uh, ha Halloween. Ooh, so that Blah. Blah. Uh, Oh, trust me, it is. Um, and the last thing I will mention that I listened to is... Oh, yeah, I listened to uh, Zach Fox's new album, uh, Shut the Fuck Up Talking to Me, uh, which is 19 minutes long. Zach Fox has only done, like, singles previously that I'm aware of and that I've listened to and loved universally. And I'm just like, damn, I really want uh, an album from this guy. And he's like, okay, it's 20 minutes long. And I'm like, well, fuck. But thing is, it's great. Uh, it's about as good as a 19 minute album is capable of being. It's got his really creative off the wall production. He is a fucking, like, he's just so goddamn funny. That man is, he, he's one of like the most clever lyricists in the genre to the point where, again, I'm spinning an album that is 20 minutes long. It's the span of a fucking sitcom without commercial breaks. And I, I'm still just like parsing through it lyrically just because it's got enough jokes and enough wordplay to, you know, fill a fucking book. Uh, but it's really easy to enjoy. It's really creative. Uh, I really just want him to make more shit. Like, cool. I'm glad you released your album finally, but like, give me, bring it on, Zach. Come on. So yeah, that's me. Uh, I guess that leaves uh, fucking the, the Hooded Justice over here. Oh, yeah. It's been a couple weeks, so I naturally I have about the amount of albums that most people have every week. 
I'll go ahead and start with uh, Slow Dive, whose discography I I finished up uh, lately. Big Million, good record. You know, second to least favorite of mine, uh, just ahead of Just for a Day, um, which is not surprising. Strange album. Oh, yeah. Very, I mean, very, post-rocky. Whack. It's so fucking it's very, whack. It's very yeah. post-rocky. It's very, like, post, like, talk, talk. Like, it has a lot of similarities. Yeah. With yeah. Like, Spirit of Eden, for instance. It mm-hmm. just has that sort of, like, spectral vibe. I really love, like, the opening track and Blue Sky and Clear, especially. Yeah, I would almost describe it as, like, ambient pop. Yeah. I don't know. It's, um, it, I found it had personally when I was listening to uh, uh, Slow Dive, like I enjoy Slow Dive, but it had, it's like, it has a lot, it's a lot more chilled out than like a lot of its other shoegazy oh, definitely. contemporary. Like My Blade Valentine always felt like you were sort of floating away to something and Ride always felt much more energetic. Mm. And comparatively, Slow Dive is much more like, chilled out laying down on a couch sort of vibing yeah i I describe it as like moody um the most sort of animated slow dive record what you have is like suv lucky probably and that even that record is dominated by just the feeling the permeating feeling of bliss more than anything else yeah i will also Um, argue for their recent self-titled as well i really like their that's my favorite i think morgan's getting to that one (laughs) Yeah, yes, this is this is good uh, because that was the other one I listened to, and yes. that album is perfect. Um, that's the top ten people, of all time for me. So, yeah. a lot of people, I saw a lot of people shitting on it for a while there. A lot like, of people I think can go Fantano fucking gave it like a negative themselves. score. I mean, yeah, stupid fucking losers. Slow mo and star <laughs> roving is such good one two punch and then sugar no longer pill. making time is the best slow dive song it's a good take sorry it's a good take point is it's front to back just fucking bliss yes, yes. it's great it's just, yes. I, you know i do still against... personally prefer suvlaki but i love both so much well, i mean i mean fuck but yeah i just love how like with the explosion of like beach house and shit which no mm-hmm. disrespect I love Bloom, but also Slow Dive just comes back and is like, all right, hold on. This is why we're the best. I'm going to let you finish. Interesting to me because, uh, like, Slow Dive really, like, a lot of people, you look at their, like, a lot of dream pop, you look at it just be mostly, like, Cockdew Twins and Fluent, stuff like that. I feel like a lot of it bears more resemblance to slow dive than a lot of people will actually like say out loud. Hmm. Like there's a lot of cockatoo twins in there, but there's a lot of there's a lot of Las Vegas, but there's a lot of Silvaki. You yeah. know, like absolutely I can hear that in like an in bloom or in bloom, sorry, bloom and teen dream. Yeah. In and bloom. Like- I'm excited for the Beach House uh Nirvana covers album. <laughs> and like even like lesser known bands from that time, like Lush, for instance, have a really big footprint on a lot of those modern bands. And I think the most Fun. impressive thing about Slow Dive is coming back in 2017, after so much time has passed, we are like their influence has been established and seen in all these modern waves of dream pop bands and indie rock bands, incidentally, that take a lot from dream pop, like Always, for instance. And then you come back with a band like with you, slow, sorry, and then Slow Dive come back with a record like they're self titled in 2017. And it's like Morgan says, even if I probably think that Beach House have more albums that I love, just because in terms of quantity, um, they still are able to come back and clear the competition, um, you know, like almost yeah. 20 years after um, their last record. So it's, yeah, and, and I don't know. It, it's kind of like a what I love about the self-titled is it's kind of like the meeting point of Suvlaki and Pygmalion. Like it has the dreamy yep. kind of like spacious bliss of of Pygmalion, whereas like Suvlaki is a record that's ashes. yeah. Whereas Suvlaki is like a record that's much more kind of tightly packed in terms of like mixing and it's like really kind of densely 
and and certain songs on the self-titled have that too like star roving which is a masterpiece and yeah you have my favorite um, slow dive song on this record which is sugar for the pill and that song is just beautifully gorgeous and and sad and and spacious and great slow-mo is one of my favorites it's just a beautiful opener Mm. okay emily why don't you go next what have you been listening to absolutely so in like say the past two weeks or so i i've listened to a few things uh for example i uh i re-listened to one of my favorite albums david bowie's low i listened to the entirety of and got well, low, low is really great. I forgot how much like the second half just kind of hits you out of nowhere. Like you're just like, this is really, Why this is really know. interesting and cool. And all of a sudden you're like, when's Bowie coming back? When's Bowie coming back? <laughs> like what? you get into that vibe, but like you're just, you just aren't. The fact like when you're listening to it on streaming as opposed to a vinyl, you just kind of forget like, oh that was coming up wasn't it and then you get like at the end of warsaw and you're just like that that track is he's not coming back until the end (laughs) he's not coming back (laughs) that track is fucking transporting like whenever it gets so good there's so many Uh, great tracks on there sound division is really great speeds of life is a great little opening track like it just uh Weeping Ball, <laughs> Subterraneans, Be My Wife. So all that. Oh, it's such a Be good record. Wife. And yeah, if you don't like it, I'm sorry. Uh, you're wrong. And D- um, D- David, hey, but- we're, we're, I'm, <laughs> I'm calling. I'm calling the music police after you. Uh, which is just Sting. It's just my, Sting. My favorite and- part of the whole album is when David Bowie says, "My wife," exactly like Borat. <laughs> <laughs> Me, my I, wife, me, I and also, Julia Holter. I will always think ago. of <laughs> what's the line from uh, I'm trying to think of what's the line from What in the World where it's like, I love you, girl, but you got problems. I, I love the way he phrases <laughs> that because it's like, because <laughs> it's just like, well, you know, oh, oh, fuck you, but damn, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I love little, it so much. Hitting, hitting close uh, to home. What else have you been listening to? Uh, I decided to, because of uh, one of the bands we're listening to this week, I decided to re-listen to some brand new. Because uh, oh. they're an amazing band. And I love me some brand new. Cheery folks! And I will say Devil and God always gets the most hype for a good reason. It's really, really excellent. And probably my favorite of theirs. But Deja and Tendo is really close. Like I used to think Deja was the weaker, yeah, yes. was, was like a like like there was a bigger gap between them. No, Deja has so many, like obviously the two singles everyone remembers with Sick Transit Gloria and the quiet things that no one ever knows because those were played on alternative radio. But like the boy who blocked his own shot in Guernica. Um <laughs> <laughs> okay, I believe you about my Tommy boy gun who down. His own shot. Both, I don't I hate high school so much. <laughs> and I worth, just uh, worth the lyrics out. on like some of these songs too, where you're like you listen to them and you're like, I should be sneering at this, but no, he put it in such a perfect way where he can hit that like emo vibe while still sounding like still sounding like really intelligent while doing it, where you're like so many emo bands just fail at that where they just they have a really good vibe and then like what lyrics will be like fuck you mom and dad and you'll be like come on man just why would you i mean Lacey was just simply a phenomenal lyricist and that's all there is to it yeah and you're he's a scumbag also, but um yes you're, you're also on the fuck one him forever po- until he dies but he's a great writer yeah you're, you're I'm, also I'm, on the one podcast where um like you could talk about any given brand new record and you'd have someone gushing like i think the one that the most podcast core brand new album is probably science fiction which is That's my favorite science, science fiction is great i will say i prefer the, the deja and the new and god and rage inside me but science fiction might have some of their highest moments it's Absolutely. just it has some of their weaker moments too like every bad I will thing that ever happened to, to me post 2017 was soundtracked by same logic 
same logic to uh, 137 is a fucking destroyer. And one of the songs I always return to is Out of Mana. That's just yeah. a banger. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Out of Mana oh, is yes. just one that you just jam. In the same way that Sewing Season is just one that you just play to just dance up and down and just go <laughs> freak out. Yeah, that fucking da-da-da-da. like it's so. Da-da-da. Oh God, this band. <laughs> you're you're in the right place because this was my favorite band for years, and I I have had your favorite album when I met you. Uh huh. <laughs> and I've had all of them at a ten out of ten at some point or another, and they're not that far. None of them are that far from that now. It is interesting yeah. to me because I do wonder what my favorite, for a while I thought my favorite Evo album was The Devil and God are Raging Inside of Me. That's I, I sometimes waffle in on a song on an album that isn't quite considered emo by some people, but I consider it. And that's Black Parade's really close to taking that one. Yeah, you're not here. Yeah. yeah. The Devil and God, I just think it's just one of those most perfect records. It's just every time I listen to it, it's so, so striking. Um, Jesus Christ is such a great song. The thing Sewing is, like, season is maybe is their best one of song. the most underrated songs of all time. Send tweet. Yeah, you won't yeah. know. I will ride for that song to the hilt. Untitled. Yeah, you won't know. Untitled. Luca. Not the song. Oh, fuck. Millstone. I, just I forgot to... how good Millstone was. I mean, Millstone is because you because sometimes I'll just return to that album and I'll just keep fr- replaying yeah sewing season like over and over again and I'll forget and I'll just jump around the album. Millstone only suffers in that comparison in that yeah sewing season might be the best song brand new ever made. So <laughs> remix of sewing season by Death Grips called sewing season parentheses yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They would. They fucking would. Uh, I'm still recovering from this brief moment I had where I remembered that the song Luca existed and I had to suppress yep. suppress something within me. See, the thing is, like, I can't, I, I find it very difficult to listen to Brand New now, and it's not even necessarily the Jesse Lacey thing. Like, I've come to terms with that. It's just the yeah, fact that, well. it's just the fact that it's really difficult to put a Brand New record on because they're so fucking painful to listen to. Yes. Like, it uh-huh. just... It, 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 it awakens something in me i mentioned science fiction like is it 157 the one that just you know let's all play oh. nagasaki which i do remember someone claimed that they were That's... racist for that line and i just was like you do not need to make up stuff That's... about him to like hate him for just like <laughs> devil and just like devil and god was morgan's favorite album at one point science fiction was mine for a very long time and i simply do not wish to return to the period in my life where i depended on that album to be no it's like i've i've heard all of them so many times Mm -hmm. that putting them on now is like why a good a good (laughs) a good litmus test for whether people are like engaging with art seriously is if they try and tell you that brand new were never good like because the of the fucking or we're, well, we're always like overrated because you know of the gcy okay. thing if people try and like yeah that uh, that's your red flag that's your I get fucking... that impulse i get that impulse but as someone who has like been touched by a lot of artists who have i mean i mentioned david bowie david bowie does not have a very clean past either no. and the same year that that happened, a few months earlier, the Power Bottom thing happened, and I was a huge Power Bottom fan, and I was about to come out, and I get that impulse to just be. And like, I was a Power Bottom. <laughs> Not saying that one. Oh. Thank, thank you, Jake. Kevin Abstract. <laughs> but yeah, I I was a you know I was just about to come out, and I had heard the album early through NPR, and when that hit, I. I heard, saw a lot of people being like, well, they were never that good anyway. And I'm like, I, that doesn't help me right now as a queer person that probably could have gotten preyed on in this situation. Like, I don't... That doesn't help I anyone, don't ever. Hear that I, yeah, like, fucking, yes, I get why you can't return to the music. I, have, I haven't listened to them in years, even though that album was kind... Not a lot of people heard it, but it was way better than Ugly Cherries, in my opinion. And sadly, no one will probably ever hear it because they didn't get an official release. And I'm kind of glad they don't because they don't want, I don't want them to get royalties. But uh, God damn it, I don't want someone to look at me and say, it's bad that you feel remorseful about this because they were never good. Because that's not a, that's not a moral judgment do. on your part. That's you 
trying to make me feel bad about my taste as I already feel bad about something else. That's that's yeah. not even that. Yep. It's just them trying to cover their own asses. It doesn't even have anything that to do too. with you or that whoever too. they're talking to. If to. To boil this down to one statement, it's I think that it's unequivocally a shallow and awful thing to do to try and score points off of a situation Absolutely. where something awful has happened like why would you try and use that as an excuse to say to to say like well actually i've always been in the right to be honest because i've never been on this train so i don't have any yeah. so it, it's just it's purely selfish and in 100 in every way but anyway probably enough of that tangent I'll, I'll get into what i've been listening to this week since i have a few things i want to shout out but this segment has gone on i'm gonna get lot. some water but i'm still listening a few things i want to shout out first thing i want to shout out is that i listened to the new james blake album friends that break your heart i love james blake i am really enjoy his stuff i particularly will ride for his first and third albums which i think are great records um this is bad it's a bad album <laughs> it sucks it's boring oh no it's just boring it's not even like it's not badly produced because Bla- james blake is a great producer but it is fucking nyquil <laughs> it's so <laughs> and like the whole thing about the record is that like it's james leaning into his most sort of pathetic like guys of like everyone oh. everyone's betrayed me and then i'm lonely and and i have my I- I don't and give a fuck world, about James Blake's persona. And the thing is, like, he can make great songs in that vein. He has made amazing songs in that vein about being lonely and sad and isolated. But this is just a terrible album, in my opinion. It's just I hate not to very say good. this. That that description solidifies in my mind the thing that I've always thought about with James Blake, which is that he's kind of bony bear in terms of like how he interacts with like hip-hop and how he's been a producer on a lot mm. of those stuff yeah but just not as prolific <laughs> well to be honest i like james blake a far sight more than i like bon Iver. um but it's with the exception of the first bon Iver album which i think is better than anything james blake has done that's it um yeah this just isn't it i'm not, i didn't enjoy it moving on um it's not it chief <laughs> I listened to the new record from Latin pop slash rock princess Xenia Rubinos, who has put out oh. two of my favorite records of the last decade, um, Magic Tricks and Black Terry Cat. Those are fantastic records, particularly Black Terry Cat, which is one of the best albums of 2016. Go and listen yeah. to it. It's amazing. Um, fantastic guitar fusion jams. This new record, however, sees is called Una Rosa, and it sees Xenia branching out into stranger sounds and into a more kind of like synthetic realm. She and it just doesn't wash from me. It, it's a bit of a letdown, unfortunately. I've really tried yeah. with this album. I tried to get into it. It has a few songs I like, but for the most part, I just don't think that the songwriting and the 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 real kind of polish first of all i don't think the songwriting's there i think there are points where the polish especially the moments where she leans into certain vocal effects which i applaud the boldness of some of them but the songwriting isn't always there and the polish can sometimes take away from what's actually interesting about the songs and about xenia as a performer so i think it's a very interesting and respectable effort at really like doing something completely unlike what she's done before and really branching out and really experimenting in a lot of ways and I applaud her for it honestly especially for trying to you know really push the envelope and do shit that you would not associate with the musical influences of like Latin music that she brings into the table like she always does stuff that's really like original and strange and cool Um, this just didn't land for me unfortunately I will come back to it some more and hopefully maybe it'll grow on me a little bit more I have people online who mutuals who I respect who really really love this record and I just haven't been able to get into it unfortunately Um, I listened to I continue my journey through the work of KO Dot and Toby Driver I listened to an album Okay, the KO Dot album Gamma Knife, which is I think the lowest rated KO Dot album on 
radio music, which really surprises me because I think this record's really, really good. It's quite underrated. The recording is questionable in terms of quality. And I think that's a, well, with a band like Chaotot, that's definitely a intentional decision. But I really, really enjoyed the haunting quality of this album. It's really only 30 minutes. Um, it's basically their typical brand of avant-garde metal infused with like weird baroque abstract instrumentation and i enjoyed it more than i was expecting to basically and that's where i met with that uh i listened to mac miller's faces so mac miller's faces, faces is one of his sort of like it's his highest rated project of any description like it, people love this project and it, it i think it's the second highest rated mixtape of all time on radio music it has like a 3.97 um from like thousands of votes so people love this album and it's 90 minutes long and it's about as good as you would expect a 90 minute mixtape to be which is to say yeah. it's pretty good um I actually probably would say it's probably better than you would expect a 90 minute mixtape to be, frankly, because it's pretty consistently strong, has some great songs, doesn't quite like connect to me, like in the way I was hoping that it would. No. And I think that's just a product of it being as long as it is. And it definitely is like, it definitely feels like a mixtape more than an album. Like it's not, the songs aren't really connected together with any kind of like flow in the way that an album would be. It's just kind of like all of these sort of ideas that are definitely of a piece musically. Like it has its own vibe, but it kind of just feels like a playlist in a certain, to a certain extent of like great songs. I think Circles is a little, or not a little, but I think it's much better, honestly. Um, uh, yeah, I, I really like Circles and I want to go back and listen to some of his other records too. But I listened to Faces because it's finally hit streaming services and people seem to love it. And I really did enjoy it. Like it has some really, really great songs on it. I want to shout out uh, real quickly while I have it up here and can remember some songs on it that I particularly loved, um, including my favorite Mac Miller song that I've heard so far. Um, uh, here We Go was really good. Um, Ave Maria and Diablo were really good. Colors and Shapes was really good. Insomniac with Rick Ross was really good. Rain with Vince Staples was really good. But the my favorite uh, song from him that I'm heard is New Faces at the end of this record with Earl Sweatshirt and Dash. This track is fucking fantastic. It's the, an amazing song that is absolutely worth hearing if you haven't checked it out already. Even if you don't care to spend the time listening to the whole project, listen to New Faces. That song rules. Uh, also want to shout out this week that I've been listening to is, oh, I, I finally li listened to uh, the Jimmy Eat World album, Integrity Blues. I've been making my way through Jimmy Eat World's discography. I've been very vocal on this podcast and on Twitter about how Jimmy Eat World are one of my favorite bands ever. And purely off of the basis of the run of records from Clarity through to Chase This Light, all of which are great, including Chase This Light, Don't At Me, that record is underrated. Um, that said, I don't re I didn't really care for Invented or Damage that much at all. Honestly, those records kind of really bored me and they just completely lacked the pulse and energy and just heft that all the records before them have. Um, so I was eagerly awaiting Integrity Blues because I know that this is a record that Morgan has highly rated and is generally considered like a re return to form moment for them. They work with Justin Meldal Johnson on this record who produced M83's Hurry Up, We're Dreaming and the recent Deaf Heaven record, both of which Morgan, well, I don't know how Morgan feels about the M83 album actually, but Morgan and I have gushed about Justin Meldal Johnson as a producer before. And he does at certain points make jimmy Heat world sound a lot like m83 on this album in a really good way it's a really strong record i don't love it as much as my favorite jimmy Eat world records but it has a lot of really really strong songs on it um it's particularly like the opening track and the closing track and that one song uh in the middle <laughs> that i'm forgetting the name of past the baby i really like that mm. track um, it'll take some time um <laughs> fuck, fuck you emily for doing that <sighs> He said uh, it was in the middle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's not an excuse. Okay, so just processing that having happened. Um, but yeah, really good album. Enjoyed it a lot. Um, I Last sort of new release I'll talk about 
is that I listened to a record that we were originally going to review this week until the Ugly Main came along and turned out to be a much better proposition, which is the new Coldplay album, Music of the Spheres. Uh, it's bad. And I know that I'm not the first person to say this. This has been the chorus of everyone has been saying this album sucks. It really sucks though. Like it's really, really bad. I don't even, I don't know if it's their worst album. I don't know if I hate it more than Head Full of Dreams. The only way I could know that is by revisiting Head Full of Dreams, which I'm simply not going to do. So too bad. Um, the reason why I'm not sure though is because it does end with a 10 minute weirdly proggy song called Coloratura, which is very much unlike the rest of the record and very good. And I have no idea how it ended up on this record, which is otherwise composed of shallow, pathetic attempts at radio play. Like it's really like amazing how boldly they're going for radio play with working with Max Martin on the whole thing, doing a BTS collab with the song My Universe, which BTS fans come at me. This song is fucking dog shit. Um, Don't come at me. Don't come at me. That, that that's on him uh, i'm not I don't, i'm not a part of this i don't want to be a part of what you just did okay i don't know how bst bts fans would find this video anyway but yeah if they do i guess i i just brought that on myself uh it also has um i mean the song titles on this record tell you a lot about the album before you even listen to it i think there's four tracks that are just emojis for titles um so fuck that and there are <laughs> There's a song on here called... Who do they think they are? JPEG Mafia? There's a song on here called Beautiful, but it's spelled B-I-U-T-Y-F-U-L. Uh, uh, and it, and it's, 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 it's really bad. It's awful. I've seen some uh, one critic mutual of mine who I respect deeply uh, to trying to defend the song, and I will not have it. It's awful. Likewise with... The track people of the pride which is my least favorite thing on this album which um it, i mean take fucking three guesses at what you think a coldplay song called people of the pride might be about and then can keep that information in mind when i tell you that this is a fucking diet imagine dragons song where johnny buckland <laughs> where johnny buckland I'm just tries to imagining get like a coldplay version of you need to calm down that sounds like believer <laughs> It's it's more like uh, a Coldplay version of like fucking same love. <laughs> that sounds like I don't believe. Well, like, like the, the, they draw. Is that why they thought that they were gay? The, the the pride thing is a bit admittedly subtext. Like it's not an explicit song about like LGBT people, but it's it's like yeah, they're real on. subtle with the title "People of the Pride." It's like God. I mean, it's not a song about the Lion King so <laughs> yeah it's a bad album it's awful it sucks i Dude. i kind of hate how cold play has become a joke because their early yeah. stuff with everything pre milo zilato is pretty good milo zilato is just kind of okay i don't know how brian well, I, you know i dig milo zilato i think it's like a, a fine like six out of ten album i enjoy it yeah um, that, that's what i would say it's just okay um and um, yeah I, I agree like i really love um viva la vida uh, i really rush of blood to the head is blood a great head. album i'll even defend x and y to a certain extent because i think that album's a little bit underrated even if it is a bit like baggy um, it's, it's it's the weak one of their first four albums for sure yeah but it has like talk and speed of sound and fix you on it which you know to my chagrin i really like those songs oh but anyway but i will say the interesting thing about their recent stuff is i did hear a lot of good things about everyday life yeah so that, that record's all right like things were gonna get better i think what they're doing is this weird to and fro thing where they make like an introspective like album where they actually put like real thought into the musical arrangements and then they follow that up like they did with i guess ghost stories although that was really ghost stories was not very good <laughs> um but like comparatively like it had the um you know john hopkins-esque like electronic aspects of it and then it yeah. had they followed that up with head full of dreams which was you know sell out move and it's like 
Everyday Life was their worst selling album. And it was probably the best record they made since um, yeah, Viva La Vida. And it was just fine. It was decent. Um, and yeah. That's the thing. The thing with Ghost Stories is that it is more introspective than Head Full of Dreams. But every time I think of Ghost Stories, I think of they call it magic and i'm like i want to fucking die that song is garbage why is that the lead single (laughs) that weirdly enough is one of the songs i don't hate on that album but i will i will um (laughs) i can't the thing is i heard it in department stores during that time yeah so that's part of why i hate it so because i would just hear it in grocery stores and stuff like that yeah it's a very mom spotify playlist song uh, I, I there's just a thing that's happened to me where like it's something about chris martin's voice now and i just hear it and immediately like my eyes roll into the back of my head uh it's just <laughs> I, I i go into a fugue state in order to not process it um but yeah it's just the same thing with me when i hear him for the weekend and i just hear the woohoos anyway that's enough um talk about bad music i'm oh gonna God, finish up they did a song with the chain smokers uh, let's not i'm gonna finish up my segment with by talking about little ugly main because we're gonna this is gonna transition into our first sort of major review of the episode and i'm gonna say i listened to a bunch of his records this week because i was really taken with the new record and i was not expecting to enjoy it as much as i did just because mainly because i just didn't have any expectations at all i just listened to it because it was getting well really well rated and i was looking for something to review this week instead of coldplay um and so but i I was really taken with the new record for reasons i'll get into shortly and so i wanted to go back and listen to his earlier stuff because i've heard that this new record is quite different to his earlier stuff i mean this new record is for starters not really a hip-hop album i mean except except for some of the the beats i guess you could argue are pretty hip-hop in some respects and some of his inclinations as a producer but he came up first and foremost as a hip hop artist, but he has been weirdly chameleonic even within that realm. So Mr. Thug Isolation, his classic sort of tribute to 3-6 Mafia and like this very particular brand of um, chaotic rap music is a really great album. I really enjoyed it. It's a really fun time. I had a, I've listened to it multiple times this week. It's just a really good like proper balls to the wall in your face um, fun time record and it also again it showcases what a great producer uh, main is like the beats are just consistently with one exception there's one track that I find really really grating that I can't remember the name of but for the most part um, the beats are fantastic um, it's just he play he portrays this like really cartoonish um, character it's and so funny it's, it's so, so funny it's so funny like songs like Slick I Red. mean think about bitch I'm luxurious like that's not what that word means at all <laughs> like songs like slick rick that's and, a, that and, word <sighs> means you can perfectly imagine it as like this memphis style rapper googling luxurious typing it in wrong and going yep that's the word i meant and then <laughs> well yeah and the thing is that like main is a verbose rapper like he's a really like intelligent and smart writer but he yeah. knows how to choose words like that to just really like stick in your head and he knows how to write yeah, rhyming it well. with goo and shit he, he knows how to write really good hooks as well like that song uh the song serious twist. shit is yeah serious shit is amazing serious shit is that if it weren't for the fact it has shit in the title that should be like the opening song to like every basketball team in the country like just that is the ultimate sports anthem that core is just makes you want to just jump up and down and celebrate like that is that is if anything could describe the little ugly main character on that album it's that is his wrestling walkout music is serious shit it just gets you hype yeah and like the hooks are so fucking good like um i got a cup full of beetlejuice <laughs> you, can't really you already it. know twisting twisting with denzel curry sounding Twisting's like pretty a, good wish like master a, wish master is great i i've been doing the fucking so hook. like rick stuck in my head too. oh god i've been doing it's the so hook gross but it's... i've been doing the denzel curry hook for twisting like walking around my oh, uni campus with that's that so funny to me 
that for a Why? while that little ugly man was the most famous between him and Denzel Curry for a bit, and then Denzel Curry started blowing up on Vine. Yeah, with the uh, um, ultimate. But he, he absolutely slays that song. Um, Throw the gun. Also, little ugly man's great on Denzel Curry's uh, EP. Eight, I think it's eighteen or is it thirteen. I haven't heard that. I have to check that out. It. it it's a very industrial based hip hop album, which yeah. as you might expect with Denzel Curry, that works extremely well. It is as with all of Denzel Curry's output, it's great. It's great. Yeah. Um, I also love the tracks Throdium Guns, which I believe is like one of the staples, most popular songs in the album. I really, really love that shit. Um, no slack in my Mac. No slack in my Mac is great. Like, fuck, this album is just a Mona fun Lisa time. Overdrive. Mona Lisa Overdrive. The only one I don't like for reasons which should be immediately obvious from the title and also the beat's not very good is the song Looking for the Suckin', which is where he takes the, the parody aspects of the album a little bit too far from my taste. But the, for the most part, it's really great. There's even a song on here called Breeze. Yeah, I'm listening to it right now. It's not good. <laughs> There's even a song on here called Breeze Em Out, which has like a cloud rap beat which is like clams casino-esque and like but like way ahead of the curve in terms of how big cloud rap would go on to be so that beat is amazing incidentally like just really really fucking great record from front to back it's, i will say with mr thug isolation like it's a great album at times it does feel a bit more it does feel its length a bit like it really it, it's one of those albums where you listen to it and you're like this is a really fun time and then after an hour you're like i'm still having a fun time but man when is this gonna stop <laughs> yeah I, I look i really enjoyed it and it is a long album but i still oh, it's a great I, album i enjoy it front to back i also want to shout out the fact that i listened to a couple of his other projects this week i listened to his album his last album before the new one which was the 2015's oblivion access which is a very different album to both Mr. Thug Isolation and Volcanic Birdie Enemy. It is the single most nihilistic rap album I've ever heard, including Earl Sweatshirt, Danny Brown, all those people. It is darker and more fucked up than all of them. It is a suicidally dark album, frankly, and it's brilliant from front to back. It is utterly heartbreaking, heartbreaking record that i'm stunned actually isn't more beloved because that record absolutely ruined me and and it has the appeal of a lot of those artists like earl sweatshirt like danny brown like you know all those alternative hip-hop artists who really dwell in that really dark place um yet also it's just front to back bars there's the great noise instrumentals and just really creative musical stuff on this album I can't give it so much emphasis because I need to like move on so we can get onto these reviews and I can use my energy in that. Remember but I said this was going to be a shorter one. But I'm, I'm not, yeah, and we're basically done now. But I just want to say that despite my low energy at this point, I, I believe in excess, I'm very close to giving that record a 10. It's amazing. 100% recommend it. Hand in hand with his shorter album released under the name Bedwetter called, um, oh, what's the name of this album? It's like volume one something. Yeah, it's got a great title that I can't remember the name of off the top of my head. Uh, I'll just get it up. It's called Flick Your Tongue Against Your Teeth and Describe the Present. And this, again, much like Oblivion Access, is very dark. The song uh, Man with a Helmet is almost impossible to listen to because of the storytelling on that song and where it goes. Um, but also at the same time, it's not exploitative or over the top or even explicit. It's just intense. And you are put into the perspective of a child experiencing a traumatic event that is not specified, but is given enough detail that it becomes just soul crushing. Uh, and yeah, so dour note to end this segment on, but I've been listening to those a lot because been relating to them a bit too much but anyway that's what we've been listening to uh and let's move in now to our first review of the day which is of course <music> little ugly main is as you all know if you've been listening to our last segment a virginia based rapper Richmond, producer I believe. I believe that's right uh, rapper producer 
um, I guess, artist of varying description. The man has many talents, real name Travis Miller, um, and made waves in the 2010s with a series of records that I just talked about in my What We've Been Listening To segment. Dropped off the face of the map after releasing 2015's Ultra Dark Oblivion Access and has returned out of the blue, essentially. He, he released a couple of what people believe to be standalone singles earlier from this record and then all of a sudden the album was just out and it is an hour long and it is the most I would say varied and colorful and I'm not sure at this point whether it's my favorite thing that he's made but this is something that I've really connected to and it's it's something that really took me by surprise the variation in sound the variation in subject matter the variation in just general emotional tone um, with a kind of focus generally on, again, being in a darker place, which is not new for Travis, obviously, but that is tempered, I think, here with some of his most colorful and rich and dynamic production that is always kind of shifting and taking you by surprise, I think, as you move through the record and doing new and creative things. I think this is one of the most creatively produced hip hop records I've heard in some time in terms of like recent releases. Uh, it's absolutely my favorite hip hop record of the year, even if it's not hip hop in the sense that Travis isn't really doing very much rapping here at all. It's much more akin to even an indie rock record at certain points or just generally alternative music. Uh, I've seen a lot of comparisons that have been leveled at this record and very few of them are comparisons to hip hop. I've seen people compare it to the Eels uh, and it does have a very Eels vibe. Uh, to a primitive radio god that one primitive radio god song that me and connor love um, and a whole host of other sort of indie rock or indie world based reference points but infused with this really creative and exciting production um yeah so emily you're our guest so i think it's only fair to invite you to speak first on how you came to hear this album, what your reaction to it was and what your feelings are about it now. Yeah, uh, it's interesting because I've known Little Ugly Man for a few years now. I remember I read it wrong at the time. I heard some people recommending Mr. Thug Isolation as like an industrial hip hop album, which it is absolutely not. Uh, it's a Memphis rap style album, but it's really fun. At the time I thought it was just good. And now I think it's pretty great. Uh, that was really, and I would return to serious shit a lot. That would be the big thing. I returned to a bunch of tracks on there a lot. And I never really went beyond that, but I wanted to, because I heard a lot of good stuff about Third Side of the Tape. Uh, but I basically came across this. Someone in my Discord pointed out that there was a new Little Ugly Man album. I was like, wait, really? He hasn't really said anything. You know, you mentioned, like, as Little Ugly Man since 2015. I wasn't even familiar with Bedwetter, which that album came out in 2017 so even that's four years ago and you know he's so eclectic like like he has so many talents it's, it's like not only does he have the little ugly main stuff which has delved into stuff like psychedelic hip-hop and memphis style hip-hop and industrial at some times but also he's done cloud rap under the name sean kemp with nicholas f uh the trick dice album and he's done work with uh he is uh, obviously done Bedwetter and he's just worked with a lot of people that it really shows. But I clicked onto a little ugly main thinking as someone who had only heard Mr. Thug Isolation that he was just going to do another, you know, sort of creative hip hop record. This is not hip hop, but it's kind of amazing. It, well, not, not just kind of amazing. It's just amazing. It's a really intense listen. The band, you mentioned a lot of comparison. I'm surprised you didn't bring up the one that I think of listening to this album because it's the one I think about a lot is uh, because it's labeled Neo Psychedelia. And I agree with that description a lot. I would compare it a lot to the Flaming Lips Soft Bulletin a lot. Like it has that sort of production wizardry aspect that uh, Soft Bulletin has, you know, how Soft Bulletin is mostly made out of like a lot of samples and synths and things like that. And there's a lot of that in there. Although I would argue like if Soft Bulletin is the optimistic side of Neo Psychedelia, if that's this, this is the 
drug addled like reflection of an like the flaming lips is a child's look at a positive life in a way this is the look of a man who feels like he has failed his child himself like it is the trippy depressive side of it and it's so vivid and it's so beautiful and i'm just super impressed by it like there's so many good tracks on here there's so many good tracks one thing i will say is just in terms of structure is and this is again a testament to Maine as a producer, is that you actually have several tracks on this record which are just instrumentals. And this is something oh, that he yeah. has done in the past as well. And I think it speaks to how powerful of a producer he is that, I mean, you might not like all of them. I know that some of them might, might be a bit divisive, but they're almost always like just as engaging as even when, when he's not present. And that's not an indictment on him either because when he is present he is very captivating and he is able to grab you and he's able to to really immerse you in his world because he writes very vividly and that's one of the things I love about his writing style is that it's it's he's poetic sure like he's a he's a very talented writer he knows how to craft words and in like imagistic and kind of picturesque way but also at the same time he tempers that with this like kitchen sink realism about his life and about the situation that he's in about the disconnection from the people that he loves or that supposedly love him his distrust of them like there's a sense of um resentment towards other people that curdles into a self-resentment as well like a lot of negative emotion that's kind of boiling into this record um and Absolutely. what is such a testament to him is that that is as potent like that sense of it and that vividness is as potent in his lyrics as it is when it's just the music like when when it's just no when he's not even rapping when it's just an instrumental or in the parts of songs where he isn't rapping the feeling that he's trying to get at is still there and sometimes it's done in a sort of slanted way like uh, there's a lot of instrumentals on this record songs like um the second track and songs like cursor where they're built around these like kind of weirdly playful like music box like almost like ch children's tv show melodies that are like either pitched to sound really really unsettling or just like manipulated in some way and it feels like you are being put into this world where everything is like on the surface sunshine and rainbows right but then beneath it once you actually pay attention that it's all very kind of like um sarcastic and scathing because the reality is like it's all a facade and the facade is cracking and that's why I like the fact that you do have those weird like twinkly instrumentals at points but they're always like wrong and you always get a sense that there's something sour and rotten within Maine and it's getting more and more present and that's reflected nicely in the way that like it's not just those kinds of instrumentals you actually have some really dark instrumentals like the instrumentals here some of my favorite instrumentals on this record are built around like really distorted guitar riffs like headboard for instance which was incidentally originally released as a bedwetter song um <laughs> this track is like the guitar on the song but it was on one of the uh, three side of tape uh tracks too oh okay cool i didn't know that this is like this really distorted stretched contorted guitar but it's like so emotive and so powerful and he's and it before he even starts rapping you immediately get a sense of the disarray of the state that he's in but it's also just so captivating and there's a lot of tracks in the record where he's able to do that with an instrumental like that porcelain slightly the closer being another really really strong example too um but yeah that's i guess just my so an overview i guess of like the general feel of the record you can get it more and more into certain songs and i'm sure that some we will um but jake i'd like to i'd love to hear from you next because i know that you um have had heard this record as well <laughs> obviously we've all heard this record but i know that you enjoy this record as well um and so i think it might be good to go to you and then morgan and then we can kind of circle back um in terms of yeah the record and what you think of the album and what stands out about it to you and what you think the album's about even 
I, I think the album's very good. Um, I think what definitely caught me most off guard about it was the fact that sort of Tyler sort of described, and I was, I had no familiarity with the artist beforehand. And Tyler sort of described it to me as like, uh, through the, the window, someone like Aesop Rock, which I do agree with, actually. It does actually have a lot of the same sort of the, the, the writing, albeit, of course, much, much darker than him and more like overtly depressed and anxious. Um, but what sort of surprised me was the fact that it was not a, a hip hop album, really, is that really it sounds a lot more like the recent wave of uh, hypnagogic uh, pop that's sort of uh, propped up and sort of popular with the kids these days. Um, and uh, despite not in really enjoying the album um, that fell under that particular umbrella slash category that we reviewed earlier this year, I, I did enjoy this a fair bit. Um, I will admit the album takes a little bit to get going with me. I think that it doesn't really hit its stride until the track Cold In Here, uh, which is really when the sense of melody and the production, I feel like, coalesced into something that feels like it has a bit more of a synthesis, whereas each track beforehand, while I wouldn't say any of them are bad in any respect, it just sort of leans on one idea and just kind of stays that way. Like, I, I don't really care hugely uh, for the the intro bird enemy car. It just it just lasts too long, and it's the same idea, and it's kind of over and over again. And like I'm not super into the musical the musicality of it. It doesn't really change up enough uh, for my taste, and I kind of feel like it just should have been shorter. Uh, and with Iron and Bleach and Accidents is a better song, uh, but still it doesn't fully captivate me quite until Benadryl Submarine, which I think is when the lyricism tries to, or really starts to shine through. Um, Human Fly also is another po point where I think it's the production is good and the lyricism is good, but it just sort of kind of loops in on itself musically. And I kind of wanted a little bit more variation just because I feel like the song kind of gestates in itself for a little too long. But once we get to Cold in here, basically the album starts hitting home runs throughout its middle stretch fairly consistently. Um, I think that Discard is one of the most thoroughly upsetting songs I've heard all year. It's just, it's a bit, it, honestly, it's even kind of a bit much at times, just, you know, the, the, the sentiment of wanting to be, you know, discarded, like trash, really. And generally the whole sort of facade of this being like, it feels like Little Ugly Mane is taking you through a tour of a broken down Coney Island exhibit. It's got all of these things that sound like the music of it sounds like all of these broken toy rides and like, it samples that sound like machines that are at, at, like Chuck E. Cheese playing in slow motion. And it just sounds like fucking clinical depression distilled into distorted there's, there's noise. I think uh, the sort of run that really gets me starts with uh, Hostage Master and sort of ends with um, my favorite song on here, which is uh, VPN. And I... Yeah, really good. This song is just stone cold fucking perfect. Um, it also just sort of gets at the sort of the online-ness of Little Ugly Mane's kind of identity, sort of, you know, with the whole, the refrain, the title of VPN, but also just sort of the, the that kind of refrain of the static walls just extend. And it's like that sort of image is just, it's fucking nightmarish. And that like that little drum break at the very beginning and the way the song just kind of swells and becomes enveloping. That's when this album is at its best for me is when it really takes advantage of the production to make its atmosphere and its sound as oppressive as its lyrical content. And it doesn't, I mean, I say this and I overwhelmingly very, 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 very much like the album, but uh, it doesn't always consistently do that for me. Sometimes the instrumentals are a little bit sparse or a little bit too repetitive to really match uh, his presence as a performer. Uh, but sort of in this middle stretch here is when I think that is the most consistently uh, done well. And I also think that it sort of, it ends very well too. Um, on Porcelain Slightly and Broken Ladder. I feel like those are two songs that really understand that. But Broken like, Ladder, Broken Ladder is a, a track where I thought I wasn't going to like it because the beginning is kind of weird with uh, the drums and everything. 
and then it just builds into something where you're just like oh my god yeah just... st- structurally that song and a lot of songs on here are just pretty fucking bewildering as to how like he's able to construct like i mean this is basically like the downward spiral by way of aesop rock if he od'd on valium that's like the that's like the most succinct way i can describe what the mood is here i would i would describe it as almost like i would describe it as sopolitan with the mood of Mm. downward spiral oh look i just now i i just been made to think about broken ladder which is a song that I mean, we're candid on this podcast. I have fully cried to multiple times this week. Uh, it just was something that allowed me to get out some emotion that I really needed to get out. And whenever there's an it's album perfect. that comes along that lets me do that, I, I'm insanely grateful for it. But that chorus hook of you can stand above me looking down, but I can see from here it's just a broken ladder. And I would trade my place with you in hell because I can say for sure it doesn't even matter. Like, it's, my God, has there been a more, like, utterly heartbreaking hook on a song this year? And just the radiant sense and the little tingle, 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 tingle little melodic thing that comes in is so And good. this is the most explicit about it being about addiction and alcohol and stuff, like the lines about take a drink, uh, yeah drink when, pneumonia when the cynicism outweighs the pollution then it always feels encouraging to sink yeah and yeah there's a moon there's a moth light and a bottle of ammonia and we're selling tickets just to see how they react it's a perfect representation in my mind although i know it's about addiction in a lot of ways it also reminds me a lot of how it can feel as a depressed person when people tell you to just exercise and go outside and do things where you're like you got up there, but for me, it's a broken ladder up there. You can't just will my yeah. way up there. It's it's so heartbreaking in a way because it's just this idea of just like, you keep telling me how easy it is, but it isn't for me. Like, this is not going to end up with the way that you think it's going to. Like, I can't, I can maybe end up at that top of there, but it's not going to be through your method. It's not going to be with that broken ladder. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's gut wrenching. It, it's fucking. It's tough. Someone described it as like a bad trip, uh, bad oh, yeah. reflexive trip during like while Sesame Street plays in the background. I think that's um neatly encapsulated by the album cover itself, which has these oh, kind of 100%. like um like cartoonish sort of puppet characters or like um costume characters while Maine is kind of like, you know, passed out at a bar, which is a very kind of dark allusion to the fact that he has struggled with alcohol addiction for a long time. And that's something that he has rapped about before. And I think that substance abuse is like uh, mostly implicit, but sometimes explicit, i.e. Benadryl submarine to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, Thing that he refers to. And and Benadryl Benadryl submarine incidentally is, I mean, that song just fucking breaks me like it's the perfect like feeling miserable song and and again yeah the the writing on this track is so fucking just like gut-wrenching like the way that he sings that chorus like I'm feeling like I'm just a bridge for you to cross a stream you watch me fall apart and never intervene Benadryl submarine like the way that line just hits as in context is is gutting because it's like yeah the, the need to be so like fucking medicated that you are essentially like you know in a fucking foreign like world there's there's like a double meaning to that too because it could mean talking about someone like he's falling apart into addiction and someone's watching him or since he says benadryl submarine it could be also addressing the fact that he gets this relief from the drug but they never help him out fully yeah and i like it, that there's a double meaning there absolutely like main is a very talented writer who 100 percent does that kind of thing like i mean the allusions to he already sets it up in the first verse where he talks about like i'll kick me around ask me your talk show questions i'll pretend i paid attention then i'll paddle out and drown um i love like he every so often he'll have a line that 
even without context is just like really striking like for instance i wonder where your dogs will go when they realize there's no more bombs to find like that's just the a, such a perfect line about like the fucking futility of existence right like we're all just so dogs good. sniffing for bombs and and when we find one it's all over and when we don't find one then it's still all over and we've had a purposeless existence um and just the kind of hopelessness in his voice when he sings run away like i'm 17 is such a powerful like emotional moment um to the point where like it's almost like so powerful for him that by the end of the song he's just like saying benadryl submarine over and over again like there's a sense and a lot of um mains music mr thug isolation accepted because that album's an, anom an anomaly but like in most of his other music you get a real sense of someone who dissociates from reality frequently and like his ability to communicate what that experience is like of being somewhere and just completely leaving your body of completely being no longer present um but still sort of like conscious is like he he's so good at communicating that and very few artists I've, I've come across very few artists who do it as well and as consistently as he does and yes it makes his music difficult to listen to sometimes if that's something you can relate to um, but it also makes it for me at least very cathartic as well mm -hmm. i would say one of the songs you mentioned a song that like destroys you with that they mentioned discard you mentioned shouldn't vengeful submarine for me human fly absolutely it just sounds like a it, even without like reading the lyrics themselves it just that once you hit that course it just sounds like this feeling of just like what do you expect i'm a mess i'm a dis i'm i'm the description of human fly makes it sound like something like you know like uh like jeff like jeff goldblum in the fly like at the end where he's just like put the gun to my head I cannot yeah. take this anymore. That that is almost how it comes off to me. And with some of these lyrics, like uh, the devil said, "Dance with my daughter." I said, "I'd consider the offer if, when I die, I can wear your cloven shoes." Like, yeah, Jesus Christ! Uh, I love. How are you um, surprised that the bluest sky loses hue at night? Oh, yeah, I love. Um, you treat mistakes like a museum. You always stand there looking parched. There's not some tapestry of reason. There's no fabric made of stars, like the parchment tapestry fabric little visual metaphor there that comes in these different ways is really great. It's all something that looks real, but is completely fake. I like that synthetic argument there. It's really interesting. Yeah. I also I, love... I um, Just to add one more thing on that song really quickly. Oh, yeah. Um, Absolutely. The thing you said about human fly, like making you think of the fly, like as in like a, a, a monstrous, monstrous hybrid is great because like I was thinking about it as being like a, you know, being so small and insignificant, but perceived every time you are perceived, it is as a pest or as something that is filthy that needs to I think be kind of slapped both. down. But yeah, that's the thing, I right? Of course it can. I think there's an element of just like, and I don't say this as like a negative, obviously. It's like an element of like, as someone who's had depression, you get into that moment where you're like, are you even surprised I disappointed you? I deserve pain. That's how he views himself in that moment. And it's rough to hear that coming out, especially someone who has heard that voice in the back of my head mm -hmm. saying that. And I mean, they get into, he gets into similar stuff too, like clapping seal, like where he's just like, where it just feels like this vibe of just like, I thought things could be positive for me once and it turned out to be fake. Yeah. And I think we've all had that feeling of just like, fuck, like, how do I keep tricking myself into thinking things are going to get better? That That's Clapping Seal is one of the best songs I've heard recently in terms of capturing what it feels like to feel like shit in a relationship or in a friendship even with someone who is like, you see it's vastly superior to you. Like Absolutely. lines like, uh, your kiss always tastes so metallic from the fillings that line all your teeth i'm the cockroach that wakes up your roommates i'm the laughter that nobody knows i just want to exhale how you can inhale when i plug both the holes in your nose like that is some of the best writing i've heard on an album this year and some of the most fucking gut-wrenching and it's on a it song basically just 
And it's on a song, yeah. incidentally, that wouldn't even make my top half of the record because it's just an album that's that consistent. And like, there is, is just such a good song. Yeah, and I mean, there's like one. Though aspect- I would take out the two minutes of silence at the end that just seemed completely unnecessary. It's one minute of silence, to be fair, and I agree with that to a certain extent. But I also think that conceptually, like it has, um, you know, like with it, it, it has a place with like the this the idea of like being able to add nothing and contribute nothing with the lines like ending the song with like there's nothing much left to discuss. But yeah, I think it probably could have been taken out as well. Um, I would probably say take it to down to 15 seconds or so. Yeah. I think that fits a lot better where you still get the feeling of silence, but you don't kind of sit there being like, is my, is my app broken? Did something happen? <laughs> did it crash? Yeah. Um, Cause I, I totally did. That. <laughs> Styrofoam is a song that I really love. It's one of the more sort of surreal songs on the record lyrically. Uh, and it has this kind of like, Oh, I love Iron this. and Bleach and Accidents is very, very bizarre in its lyrics. Yeah, but in Styrofoam... That's the lo- first track with lyrics. And in Styrofoam, I love the fucking, like, old-timey, ragtime, like, instrumental that kind of evokes, like, 40s, 50s music. And then over top of it, Maine is, like, doing this surreal and dark lyricism, like, my teeth are contraceptives, they keep the that's words inside too, my at the mouth. beginning. Yeah. Um, I don't know what that's from, but the ha ha ha. Hello? Yes, this is purgatory. The devil's speaking. I don't know why, but it's just a perfect sample. Because, like, someone could put that on something else and it would feel too obvious. But here, it just fits with the vibe of, like, it, this album feels like, as I said, like a drug trip, almost like you're flipping through the channels. Like, it feels like that mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. It fits to just have that one direct line because it's kind of it, it's obvious in a way that fits for what the vibe is mm. absolutely um morgan i'd love to hear from you at this point you haven't said a damn word yet what do you think of this record i think the man is a great writer that, that pretty much speaks for itself and you all have elaborated on that quite well and i can only second that but psychedelic music which i think this pretty firmly is in so many ways very rarely does anything for me and you know as far as that goes i enjoyed this all right but i don't really have anything substantial to add to the discussion here um it just is firmly in the not for me camp all righty no fair enough uh, I certainly think that Emily and I have got probably enough thoughts to keep this uh, p- fully packed anyway. I've barely even talked I, about certain songs in this record. I feel like the song that we have to talk about is what, in my opinion, is, is my favorite track on there. I think it might be yours too. It's And it's maybe my favorite song of the year, which considering it's competing with Knees by Injury Reserve and like Slow by Black Midi, like that's a tough list to top. Yeah, and that's headboard. Uh, I don't know what my favorite song is on here, but headboard is undeniably top three. I think that the three track run of discard headboard and into a life, in particular, those three songs together are like a, a an amazing sequence that I've been playing over and over and over and over. But yeah, headboard is becoming quickly. Done. It's becoming quickly one of the most beloved main songs among fans. And it's very easy to see why. It's just that guitar riff is so immediately just like disorienting, but also like gripping. And I've had it stuck in my head for days. It's He's done this track before, obviously, as I mentioned, like it was a Bad Widow track. It's a three-sided tape uh, track version as well. This is the best produced version of it so far. It is the most clean version of it. It is the one that really fits into that like the other ones are a bit more lo-fi this one fits much more into like the spacey vibe of just like feeling like you're floating on air and it just it it's one of those perfect songs that really encapsulates like this beautiful vibe with it Mm -hmm. and there's like this feeling of just like 
feeling lost in everything like everything's sort of claustrophobic and closing in on you you know uh, i'm trying to look you know a, often a dream a dream not worth discussing cannibalize all versions of myself where i wait for the eruption to collapse me into hell but like there's this version of like with the instrumental in the background i, I think perfectly fits it it feels like this vibe of just like admission to it like it's surrounding you it's chaotic but you're just sort of used to it in a way like you have submitted to it mm. and i really respect how it able is able to deliver that in a way it's just one of those tracks where even if you're not listening to the lyrics you just get such a vivid feeling from it that just overtakes you and it's going to be a track that I'm going to be listening to like every week for the rest of the year, like with no contest there. Like it, oh my God. As I say, like up there with tracks like Knees by Injury Reserve, uh, Slow by Black Midi, Haunted by Laura Less is like one of my favorite tracks of the year. And as you probably know, all those tracks are stellar. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, like, this album has so many contenders for me for, for like, best songs of the year. I mean, Benadryl Submarine, which we've talked about beautifully already. Discard, yeah. which Jake beautifully described. It's up there. Uh, Horseman Slightly as well. Yeah, I was going to say that one as well. Um, I want to shout out Into a Life, because to me, this is one of the most, uh, I guess, direct and intimate and just there's like a, a sense of like tragedy on this whole record and a sense of like real like you know darkness and 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 just the worst feeling but this is one of the songs where it just feels so genuinely sad in a way that's like really just nakedly emotional and beautiful and that instrumental that oh, looping it, instrumental it's so beautiful it, it, it's stunning and just that refrain of i want to get back into a life where i know you like, like there's so much of this record is main rapping or singing rather with a kind of bitterness about his life and about the world and a kind of sour feeling that he's experiencing as a result of his depression and as a substance abuse or whatever but this is like a moment where it's not rooted in bitterness. It's just rooted in sadness. And it's just rooted in like a desire for things to be better. And That's... that makes it so tender and so like necessary. And uh, I just, I, I, it's very, very if, sad. If I can get a little personal here, and I, I will say for the record, you were allowed to keep this into the podcast. I want to include this. Okay. I, I've been very public about this. I was someone who was on antidepressants for a while and they stopped working for me. Those specific ones that they were, it was Prozac. It did not work. It's one of those pills. It's infamous for working for a few years and sort of stopping after that. And it did that for me. And I fell into a depression spiral for like the last two years or so. And the whole thing during that time was just me being like, I know life can be better than this, but it feels like I can't get back. And that's almost like what the song feels to me. It's just like, I've experienced happiness. I've experienced what life can be like. And I just wish I could go back to that, but it's not that simple. I just want that life back. And it, oh, it's so painful and vivid in that. And I, yeah, I respect the fact as somewhat, and I think that's a big experience for someone who has had like a spiral is like to have that feeling of like, it's been normal before. Why can't I get back there? Yeah. Um, I completely agree. Words were hanging off my lips and my dumb brain was on the fritz. I was probably full of shit anyway. I'm still falling off the bar. I'm still living way too hard. I'd like to tell you something you could praise. Come and he's, how, how, how dare you? How dare you, sir? How dare you at me like this? How dare you? It's not also fair. Also the refrain at the end, like, you know, the famous, I want to get back. Yeah. I like how the end where, like, you can hear his voice breaking at the end. Yeah. Like, there's something very oh. emotional about that, where it's just like, oh, no. Like, yeah. he, this is a thing that where he's willing to go out of his range to talk about it. Yeah. just because like that's how much it affects him and like there's sometimes like that would be a negative but in a track like this like that really works well oh god it just 
Uh, agreed 100 percent. and the little i think it's an oboe in the background that's repeating during that part oh, yeah. i i forget what that is but it's it's so beautiful that like that's where it lifts up at the end mm. and oh i think um it's such a good track i would agree with you that's one of my favorites on the album that might be my second favorite behind headboard benadryl submarine's also up there VPN uh and we, we talked about VPN I want to talk about something specifically about it that I think is really cool Go which for is, it. we mentioned the internet symbol symbolism there I think there's something there about like how the persona that he's built online has almost trapped him in a way where everyone sh- like sort of views him as like this genius who they wait on his every move and everything like that and when I, I'm not successful enough to have exactly that but there's something of an expectation sometimes where you worry about if you're living up to how people see you. And I don't have that as much, obviously, as he does, because he has hundreds of thousands of people following his every step. You know, like, people know who he is. Maybe not in the mainstream, but people do know who he is. Yeah. And that can be... I, I've talked to a lot of, like, creators with big followings and stuff, and they always agree, like, there is an expectation in there of just, like, if, I'm not, if I don't live up to who they want to be, I'm a failure. Mm. And I think that really encapsulates like this idea of just like him in the song basically describing like never wanting to leave his house, never wanted like being trapped inside by something like as he describes with the VPN, like something that represents the internet mm. and not being able to get outside that, not even wanting to, just because he is afraid of facing those expectations and i think that almost reflects the long break in music for him he might have just considered for a while like if i come back to this persona are people going to hate that it's not the same or are they gonna hate that it's not as good as it used to be it, it's kind of like doubly... ironically enough this might be my favorite thing he's made so <laughs> it's kind of like doubly tragic in the sense that when people have certain expectations of you and they expect you to live up to a certain thing and you're an artist who is making like a person has built a kind of persona around this naked admission of like your how shit your life is essentially and how much you're struggling and you have to put that into your art well not necessarily have to but like you if you were to make honest art you have to draw on that and you have to you know make something that with that is fully embedded in it whether it's like just you know whether it's, there's pleasure in it from a catharsis point of view or whatever but you have to do that and you're managing expectations as well and and, tr- and it, like yeah to make music that is, that is this kind of beautiful and intense and emotional um and and so clearly personal um cannot be easy and i don't think that's something that people appreciate enough in general with artists is how difficult it must be like people assume that it must be when you have when you're a shit person it must be really 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 easy to just pour, put all of that into music because it's all you're experiencing but if you're an artist that takes yourself seriously it, you'll probably you're probably a person who has fairly high standards for themselves and so then it becomes torturous to do that to actually make something that you feel reflects what you want it to reflect this complicated dark awful state you're living in in a way that you're satisfied with and proud of and comfortable with sharing like all that stuff um is things that people overlook when they think about like tortured artists or like depressive artists or like you know artists who capture that experience is how like difficult that must be and i mean to me being able to communicate that in a powerful way that connects with people is triumphant and so I, you know, I, I, it's inspiring to me when I connect with an artist like Lil Ugly Mane. In a weird way, inspiring isn't the word I thought I would use, but it kind of is in that sense. You could and say that this album really reflects how he looks uh, lugubrious. Lugubrious. That is the actual reference. That is the actually what that word means. It means sad. <laughs> yeah. Bitch, I'm morose and lugubrious. That's just a great line. <laughs> um but yeah let's oh, <laughs> it's really funny to listen to this album and then contrast it with some of the lines on that album because it's just 
Yeah. It's just like really morose. And all of a sudden you hear a line like, I'll stick my balls in her throat or something like that. <laughs> or it's, oh no, I, I nut all over her tits and butt was one of the lines. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. A little, little ugly man is a land of contrasts. Um, <laughs> he contains he can, multitudes. He, he contains multitudes. That's right. Um, last song on the record then, because we haven't really talked about it yet, and I know we both agree it's a highlight. Uh, Porcelain Slightly. Um, this song, again, I've mentioned the fact that there are instrumentals here that have these really kind of distorted and great sort of guitar parts that are they're built around. And Porcelain Slightly is particularly impressive and in how intricate and gorgeous the production is in general and how beautifully it ties a bow on this entire record and its experience in this very kind of conclusive way. Uh, it, it's, it's just an amazing song. It really is. And it really describes like this idea of just like, as I view it, like there's this thought in his brain of like, as the album has shown, like, fuck, there is no place to hide. I, yeah. I want to get away from this. I want to stop, but I have to deal with this. Yeah. And I think but, that's kind of how the album has to end. It's a very depressive way of describing it, but it's a real accurate one of like, like if I, I do not deal with this directly, I am going to die. And that is, that is a heartbreaking sentiment, but it's a true one in a way. If you do not approach depression or addiction, in a way that's serious and honest, it will destroy you. And I can speak from experience on both of those. I I don't have any addiction, but I've had family members that I've lost to uh, depression and suicide. And I've had uh, had a family member who uh, had serious addictions. It is, has been recovering for a decade and I has been sober for over a decade. I really respect that, but it's something that is hard to beat unless you approach it directly Mm. and i think this is him admitting that in that last song yeah the thing i love about this song the thing the song really gets is like we talked about this idea of like depression keeping you like restricted like you're not able to leave your house you're just kind of wallowing and what this song gets is that when you like you you keep yourself tucked away to protect yourself from the world or to you know protect the world from you or to like you know not have to experience shit and not have to like let people see you in that state so you have a way of hiding from the world um by staying in your bedroom and staying locked away like that is it's not the perfect it's not a great solution at all but like it's it's something that you can you when you're really depressed you're put into a state where it seems like the only option And then what this song is about is the fact that, yes, while home and your room might be a place to hide physically, psychologically, there, as Maine says in the song, in the chorus, there is never any place to hide in your mind. And that is the ultimately, like the ultimate sort of most depressing sentiment, like the lyrics here are, are gorgeous. Um, I count the stars like anniversaries from a window of this prison that I'm in. Sometimes the world will show me mercy then shatter my relief like porcelain. And then that refrain of rotting home, rotted home over and over again, like that sense of something that is associated with safety and family and foundation. The home is is rotted by his presence and by his festering. And whether it's the physical home he lives in, the home he's hiding in, or whether it's the the world of his brain, like has the home of him, his consciousness has rotted to the core. So yeah, not cheery, but it is a fitting way to end the album in a sense, because it's like an ultimate reflection on his state of mind. It there's a there's an element there in the rattling hall of like he doesn't say it obviously but in my mind i can almost imagine him saying like directly like i need this to change i need this to change yeah like there's an element there of just like this has to pass by i cannot keep doing this and i i think that ending that way is very important because if it ended just on another track on any other track on this album it would have just it would have left while this is still a downer at the end like it's more of a finality to anything else it's the idea of like 
if I keep living like this, I can't keep living like this and there's no escape. There's something really honest and final about that, about mm-hmm. like, this has been a journey, but I cannot, if, if I'm still doing, if I'm still talking about this stuff three years from now, I, I haven't learned anything. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a good note to finish up on, honestly. And yeah, I mean, somehow this album is still like fucking Disneyland compared to Oblivion Access and the Bedwetter stuff. So approach that with caution if you if you decide to. But yeah, God bless little ugly main from making i there's been like five times where i've accidentally almost said little uzi vert and i fucking hate <laughs> myself for that i would like to jump off a cliff favorite tracks and ratings for uh little ugly mains eternal art k <laughs> no no yeah. um jake why don't you go first favorite tracks going to be vpn porcelain slightly and headboard uh least favorite track uh i'm gonna say the first one bird enemy car doesn't do much for me uh and i give the album a 7.5 okay morgan my favorite tracks are vpn headboard and i'll say into a life um least favorite i have human fly and I'll give this a six and a half. I don't remember why I'm a human fly. <laughs> yeah, it's because it's funny stuff. I'm so funny. Uh, Emily, why don't you go next? Uh, I I adore the album. This was basically it's. I rated it as one of my third favorite album when I first heard it a week ago. I think it might be my second favorite album of this year so far. Uh, the first obvious being being my first appearance on here. Uh, whoops, I appeared on here to talk about one of my favorite albums of all time. The first time that gave a very wrong expectation of how I listen to music. Um, that was still a I, fucking fire review, though. And with this album, I'd say my favorite tracks are Headboard. Obviously, I said it's my favorite track on this album. Uh, Into a Life, Human Fly. In Benadryl Submarine, although Porson Slightly is also, oh, there's so many good tracks on here. My least favorite, I guess Styrofoam. I think Styrofoam is the one that fits the least on this album in a way. Like, I love the production, but it feels, it feels the least in line with the more trippy songs on here. But I still think it's a good song. It's just the one that sticks out the weirdest to me. I don't know. I don't remember any songs that stuck out as particularly bad to me. Uh, my least favorite track is Clapping Seal Silence. Is, does that work? <laughs> that's that's the only... Nine one. out of ten. High nine out of ten. My three favorite tracks on Volcanic Bird Enemy uh, are um, Porcelain Slightly, Headboard, and Broken Ladder, I guess. It's it, oh, Benadryl Submarine. Fuck. Uh, least favorite <laughs> track... Um, uh probably just because it's really really short and i I guess less essential probably bold feudal flavor but i've been thinking about this the whole week i've had it sitting at a nine and i am been listening to it over and over and over again and i don't even want to skip the weird minute of silence and clapping seal anymore because it goes by so quickly for me now and i just need it as a breather before vpn comes in and fucking whips my asshole so i'm going to give this a 10 ow uh fuck you 2021 for being so good that by the time this year finishes i'm on track to have more tens than albums in my top 10 of the year and that is stupid (laughs) so i'm sorry what it's it's dumb it's stupid and i hate it um but also I, also i like the idea you said whipping my asshole and all i could think of is like oh yes volcanic bird enemy bdsm i just putting that on well i don't know why it, I said, like, it hurts but it feels good i don't know why i said whipping my asshole like that's not how that works um, i mean it's really specific i love casino royale um, 
To the right! A little bit to the right! The asshole. <laughs> well, a funny man, Mr. Vaughn! That's what he meant by to the right. <laughs> little Ugly Mane said... Told me, seen little Ugly Mane told me... Little Ugly Mane told me just the tip and then he fucking ruptured my colon. Um, anyway... <laughs> Uh, that said, uh, that said, oh god, uh, this you album describes so many albums. Like, <laughs> this album gets an eight point three <laughs> average from the podcast. And Ew. let's move on now to our second and final review of the day, which is a, a long-awaited one. We this record, next record, has actually been out for two weeks, but we didn't want to review it last week because, well, I think the main reason was just that Morgan wasn't going to be here, and and this is a very Morgan core record. Um, and now we, now even though August isn't here, we still have Emily. So we still have a kind of like a, a core forward to touch this album. <laughs> I meant to say touch on this album, but I said touch this album because I'm so tired. Um, <laughs> really really at the whipping Black my asshole comment, comment, comment aren't just you? Like, Your kids have touched me and I'm pretty sure I've touched them too. <laughs> oh dear. This is just making me like. I really hate when I'm touching albums and getting my asshole whipped. This is just making me think of like last night when I when I watched Dune, and the whole time I was just I just kept had had that tweet in my head of like who up playing with they worm, and I just couldn't get it out of my brain. <laughs> um. I... Anyway, ah, uh, well, the okay. album. The the album is. I think that the only way of starting this segment, the only way of starting this segment is by handing over to Jake because Jake, I, this album has become Jake core, instantly canonized as Jake core. And for reasons that our viewers will soon discover. And I think you also know enough about this band, I think to introduce them reasonably well anyway. So yeah, why don't you just kick us off with what this album is and who this band is. The world is a beautiful place and I'm no longer afraid to die is sort of that like, you know, the 2010s kind of wave. I don't know if it's the fourth whatever fucking wave, but it's that wave of kind of emo and also a whole lot else. They're kind of a band that's difficult to classify. If you've ever heard anything from them, I mean, barring maybe always foreign, which is definitely a little bit less ambitious with its sound. Um, even something as comparatively modest as whenever, if ever, is something that delves into a whole lot more than just an emo sound. It's kind of taken, there's a bit of a label of post-emo on it. There's elements of post-rock that are in it. I mean, the first track on that instrumental on whenever, if ever, is just like pure um, post-emo is what I do when I'm in a depressive state. <laughs> oh, well, um, the the point is is that this band have an incredibly eclectic sound that has sort of been synthesized from from multiple genres and as they've gone along they've got like they've released tons of uh singles after they did um whenever if ever and then followed it up with uh, harmlessness which is also a very critically beloved album um and they've done a bunch of stuff. They've done like a spoken word EP. They've done their follow up, their third album, which I mentioned a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and then this just sort of happened. This single for this new album dropped a couple of months ago. And I just remember being baffled because it's just like, oh my God, when did this become a prog band? And like, you can see the roots of a lot of it in their earlier music, but not really to this extent. This is like, more than anything else, I would classify this as a progressive rock album. And it has a lot of indie rock. It has a lot of emo in it. And honestly, it synthesizes all of these so well. I really kind of fail to give it a particular like genre label confidently just because it sounds so singular really I think the biggest point of comparison of course is why this is a uh, 
bit of a Morgan album as well is that it sounds very reminiscent of early Coheed and Cambria. Uh, Second Stage Turbine Blade is pretty much the album that comes to mind when I think about this record. But it is still quintessentially this band. It is not them batting outside of their particular average. The synth tones on this are the same very bubbly, colorful ones that you would hear on Whenever, If Ever. And the singing itself, I mean, on songs like uh, Queen Sophie for President is like, I, I mean, that's borderline a pop song. Uh, the way that hooks are constructed on this album is surprisingly traditional a lot of this is like in many ways despite it being a progressive album I would say that this is one of the most accessible ventures that they've had thus far especially if you're sort of into this area of music and as somebody who really fell in love with whenever if ever I never expected them to do something like this it's just not something that I ever like it isn't even something that I wanted just because it never occurred to me it would be like if all of us, I mean, like, it would be like if brand new science fiction was like Dark Side of the Moon, it would just be like, wait, what? That, excuse me? But lo and behold, we have basically just added a whole new venue of shit that I like into this. And yeah, um, as we've kind of built to, in my opinion, this is, uh, this is a big fucking deal of an album, at least for me anyway. Um, a lot of it for me has to do with the sound of it. I just am utterly in love with every single instrumental choice on this. The great thing about this band and that this band has always done is that the instrumental variety is exceptional. There are so many musicians in this band that all specialize in so many different things that they are never short on ideas. In fact, you could accuse them of being a little bit too like eclectic for their own good. But on here, the progressive synthesis is just fucking seamless. Every single time there's an unexpected choice, there's like little horn embellishments on the tie on the, not the title track, the, the first track where uh, it's sort of doing that the first half of the song is this really, really slow buildup and you kind of hear these like horns accent the edge of the mix at one point. It's, it's just fucking perfect. Or even this record's more lower key moments that are shorter songs like uh, Blank Drone, which I can't remember the last time I loved a minute and 30 seconds of music as much as I do that particular song. There is a part where there is a string embellishment that follows this really, really, I think it's a synth, but whatever that sound is, it, it feels like, it feels like the first time I heard How to Disappear completely and off of Kid A, where I was just like, oh my god, I have never heard this sound before, but it's the most emotionally evocative thing I've ever fucking heard. And God, it's, it's all over the place. Structurally, this album is as ambitious as it could possibly be, uh, but without being unruly or difficult to pin down, it still remains to be accessible. It's catchy, it's fun. This album has so many fucking hooks. It has hooks all over the goddamn place. I fucking, Queen Sophie for president, has been stuck in my head ever since this fucking album came out. The set, it, it's it just every single part of it feels like a hook. Every single part of it. And I love the fact that they've really split up the amount of singing that their multiple singers do on this record. They really give time to everybody and they let everyone shine at just the right moment. Oh my God. Fuck. <laughs> The, this is a weird comp well maybe not a weird comp actually because both emo but like it's like Los Campesinos right where the dynamic of the male voice and the female voice is just as yes. integral to this band as any instrumental contributor and I want to get this right because there's multiple vocal um, vocalists on this record mm -hmm. um, male and female but I believe mm -hmm. the vocalist on Queen's Side of Your President I'm sure fans will correct me if I'm wrong is Katie Dvorak who also plays yes. the synth and she is fantastic. I have been like singing to myself that refrain of tear out your sprained neck like a whole week. And, and it's like her vocals soar on the song and just like that never get better and 
never do anything. Never get pure, pure. Hold on now, youngster. That is fucking the whole fucking song. I just, I couldn't help but think about that album the entire time this was going. And fuck, I such a ranger of a song. And that, and it's far from the only one too. Like the song immediately after that, "Invading the World of the Guilty" as a spirit of vengeance is first of all the most metal fucking song title of the year. Secondly, fuck, this really just changes the pace up of being like a just blitzkrieg of a fucking song. I th- this is sort of when I started to pay like a little bit more attention to sort of the lyrical content of the record, which. I won't say is a weakness of this band. I think that this band is full of immaculate writing, but for me, whenever, if ever, was sort of the closest they got to perfection with that is they sort of evoke this really ephemeral late teens, early twenties, this is what it's like to be alive in the world right now, kind of struggling lower class thing. And they captured that in a really authentic way, but here it's almost, they take it and they make it conceptual. What's fucking fascinating about this entire album is that from the album cover to the sound to the lyricism, all of it is cloaked in basically what is more or less a concept of them taking being alive in the world right now and not like a, in a quarantine album way, but in a like, hey, uh, are you alive right now and don't have a lot of money and feel like shit all the time and you're mentally ill and you're fucking all of this shit? And it dresses it up in like a fantasy concept to the point where there is nerdy video game lingo scattered throughout this fucking album. They talk about Phoenix down with Phoenix down stuffed with illusory walls is a Dark Souls reference for fuck's sake on fucking uh, yeah died died in a prison of holy orders has fucking. There's a part, there's like a the, or the guitar line in like the second half of this song. It sounds like the Final Fantasy V battle theme. And I fucking guarantee you that that is exactly what they were going for with it too. It's, a, it's almost a one-to-one interpolation of it. And I can't get enough of it to the point where when I listen to something like Blank Drone, which I think is a perfect structural choice to come after the really, really high energy points of the previous two songs. It feels like you're in a save room in a video game. Like you've just fought a boss and you're taking a time to like chill with your party to heal up and you take a moment. And it's like the lyrics here too, just like it really get at this moment of like, I love the brevity of this song because it sort of pushes to the forefront of just like, you only get this much time to rest. Everything can only be like this for uh, uh, this given amount of time. And fuck. And then it goes straight into something like the the following track, which uh, we saw birds through the hole in the roof, which, ah, I, look, there's not a single point on this album. That riff, that fucking riff. And the way it pays off in the end where it just kind of goes, bam. And then it sort of like does that and then it does that again. And then the final time it does it. And then the song just kind of fucking explodes. And I'm just, I, I lose my mind. There is no structural choice here that does anything short of absolutely excite and or fucking just make me want to pound the roof of my car like I'm in the Big Lebowski. I love every single thing about this. Not to mention the fact that th- this is one of the first times this band has had one guitarist on their album. And this is, what the fuck, man? This guitar work is insane. This is stupid. Like this is like, it's borderline. Like if it wasn't so concise in all of the song structures, it would be borderline masturbatory how good this sounds. The combination with maybe the like I haven't heard a lot of people talk about anything other than like this but like just the 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 drumming oh my god who what in human fucking jazz drummer is able to pull off these absolutely fucking insane fills I don't know that would be the amazingly named Stephen Buttery well he's buttery (laughs) fucking smooth He lives up to his fucking name. And this all is like, I can just keep repeating praise upon praise upon praise for all of the instrumental choices and how all of them sound so perfectly textural, how all of these sound 
tangible. I mean, we were talking about Julia Holter earlier and how every single instrumental choice just felt like it, like you could feel it tangibly while listening to it. This has that exact same quality. Every single time there is an embellishment of a synth or a string or even just a riff, I feel it in my fucking bones. And when you combine that with the hooky writing, it makes this feel like th this is better than any caffeine on planet Earth. And it keeps going and keeps going. And then you get to something like uh, Died in the Prison, which just this song is like, lyrically speaking, I think this is maybe their best accomplishment, but this song in particular is fucking heartbreaking. It's oh my so, God, the storytelling. so dark. It's, it, I mean, it's excruciating and like it threatens to almost collapse under its own weight, but there's a sense of pervasive, like a journey. Like I literally feel like I'm going, like I'm watching Fellowship of the Ring when Afraid to Die begins. Like there is a sense of, of journey and wonder and exploration through this album and the forward momentum just keeps it going. And you feel like the things that you're doing every day as this fucking poor ass person who's you know working a fucking shitty job, which I have been doing since fucking August and it sucks ass. And still you keep on going, you keep fighting, you get paid and there's tons of illusions on this album of, you know, like bosses are referred to as like employers are referred to as like gods, uh, which, you know, and, and you know, you can incur their wrath or something like, you know, they're a fucking totem in an Elder Scrolls game which again, just adds to all this nerdy shit that I of course love and fuck with. And it goes through to stuff like Blank Worker, which is maybe the most explicitly like thematically like concise song on here. And then it talks about- I too able... have read the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> yes, but it also just fuck, it never gets like bogged down in that because he talks about not being able to afford medication and wanting to be able to hug his loved ones one last time. It's like, God, fuck, I hate being alive. But also, this fucking band. Would you this, say this you're is not all, afraid to die? I, I have a thing about that, actually. <laughs> all of this that I've said, this is the first half of the album that I'm talking about. This is the first nine songs. Because the 10th and 11th song on this album are the second half of it. Because they are fucking 15 and 20 minute long songs called Infinite Josh and Fewer Afraid, which like, ah, it's a bit difficult, frankly, because this is like, I think Tyler described these as like having a fucking Godspeed You Black Emperor song stuck at the end of your fucking emo prog album, which basically, yeah, it feels just like that structurally down to the usage of spoken word segments in something like Fewer Afraid and yeah. Infinite Josh. And I... There has not been a better moment in music in 2021 than the moment in Fewer Afraid where they call back to whenever, if ever, and start singing the chorus to Getting Sodas. I, I wept. I was Jake. driving when I first listened to this in the middle of the fog in the morning in Lexington, driving away, and I was listening to the end of this song, and then I just heard that chorus, and it, it melted me instantly. I was, it was fucking embarrassing i'm glad no one was around to see it frankly jake um when i listen why are you telling it to the entire audience <laughs> oh th this is what jake does um and this is why we love jake is this candidness but jake when i i heard this album before you and when i heard it um i was like i definitely wasn't going to spoil the ending of that song don't worry but mm. i was like when jake hears this like this specific moment I knew it was going to level you. I knew it was Getting gonna... Sodas is one of my favorite songs ever. So them calling back to this and essentially repeating that, and there are references to their other albums littered across this whole thing. It yeah. feels like a, a really rewarding experience as a fan who's really gotten into them over the course of the past year. But these final two songs are, they're something else. Infinite Josh in particular just it really leans into their sort of post rocker like kind of structure uh, that they can kind of lean on in their records before this. And honestly, this choice is something that they've done to before technically because Harmlessness ends with two very, very long songs. And this feels like an evolution of that. And 
when I'm listening to these and I'm listening to something like Fewer Afraid, which I almost feel like goes under discussed just because of how fucking great Infinite Josh is, which it is. Um, and these two songs are easily two of the highlights of this year in music for me. But Fewer Afraid, not just that moment either, is that every crescendo in this song, every lull in energy, every moment it takes to build up, every moment that that spoken word segment goes on, and every single word of that I feel in my fucking bones like I'm listening to Lift Your Skinny Fist Like Antennas to Heaven again for the first time. I listen to the end of that. And then the sort of, I, I hear the, the ta their take on their own band name in the chorus to Getting Sodas. And I think of the world is a beautiful place. We're no longer afraid to die. And I think of the first song is called Afraid to Die. And somewhere along the way, when I was listening to this album, I was just kind of like, you know, I feel like there's a lot of darkness in this album. There might even be more darkness in it than there is light, technically speaking. And that is hard just because dealing with stuff like that is hard, especially considering this speaks right now to the moment. It speaks right now to me as somebody who's very much in the audience of what this is thematically getting at. Uh, and, and obviously this is all instrumentally something that is, it, it, it feels parodic that it exists because it was designed in a lab for me. But this band starting their album with Afraid to Die just there's something really meaningful in that because when I really examine that title, it's just kind of like, oh, you kind of, it's like, oh, it's kind of like a joke because of the band's name. And then I'm just kind of like, but if we're afraid to die, doesn't that really just mean we keep on wanting to be alive? This is the thing, like that getting sodas and um, it's callback and fear afraid. The lyrics not, I'm no longer afraid to die, despite the yeah. fact that's the band name. It's if you're afraid to die, then so am I. And so am I. Which is about, it's not about not fearing death. It's about no being like it's it's about embracing, you know, not being lonely. It's about embracing like you're embracing you're other people friends the, the things that keep you going and i mean i don't have to tell you how important these things are to me because if you watch this podcast you fucking understand yeah exactly why and it's it, it th this album just came like a like a bat out of hell and frankly it floored me i hate there, when my album comes single, there's not a single part of this that i am not fully and wholly in love with and it's one of those instances where it's like this was when we reviewed punisher last year my favorite album ever as of right now morgan said that when he first heard it that listening to that album was like when you hear something and you just know you're going to be listening to it for the rest of your life and i feel like i knew that that was that this was one of those albums before it was even over it was just so it was, I mean, there, there's nothing left to even expound upon. I, I simply, like, I could break down to a molecular level as to all of the reasons this is great and good, but I, I simply want more people to listen to it because, quite frankly, it has not gotten the hype I feel it deserves, even though this is a beloved band. It's still kind of a cult band. It's, it, it's going to get lost in the sea of new releases that are going to come along, and that's fine. But Jesus fucking Christ, give these people everything because they deserve it. There's also, I also have to mention, there's a moment, there's a fucking moment in Invading the World of the Guilty where they start, um, they say numbers. And I was just like, that's a strange thing to do. And then I read some interviews with the band and they were talking about how so many, like their song construction and lyrical construction, it's a lot of it is just done separately and then put together at the end they sort of put it all together, but this was something they wanted to step up for. They really wanted to make something new and definitive and great. And here they were, they were talking about all their influences, channeling all these things. And the lead singer who sings this part, um, they're talking about how they were just like, oh, I figured this was like a moment where we were taking from one of our influences, like at the drive-ins relationship of command, which I hear a lot of post-hardcore in this album. I don't know about you all, but they're talking about that and they're like, there's sort of words and passages in that album that are just sort of 
textural. They just sort of serve the completely different purpose that normal lyrics do. And they didn't even realize that these numbers that are supposedly meaningless, they're dimensions for a coffin. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Yeah, I read that somewhere as well this week, and that really hit me. Um, e Bear Bridgers approves. Uh, 100%. Um, something I want to say uh, is like, just to kind of contextualize this a little bit more, is that the world is a beautiful place and I am no longer a di- afraid to die. I mean, the title immediately tells you something, which is that this is a band that's easy to rag on. Uh, and a lot of people have taken joy in ragging on this band over the years. There are a lot of people who root for this band to fail, and we're not going to give them your time. But it's important to acknowledge because this record really, I think, represents this band putting everything into this album in order to say both fuck you to the people who have denied them or who have called them washed, who've said they're broken up because they have had shared members over the years, um, mm-hmm. and they I believe put in the liner notes of this record um, we're never breaking up fuck you or something like like that like they just put that into the Hell line, yeah. line of the records liner notes of the record and another thing this is cool this is interesting is that one thing that that really divided the reader the subreddit for r slash emo uh, m- m- multiple years ago was when the lead singer came out and said that like all cops should commit suicide <laughs> And that tells you something about the, I don't want to paint with broad brushes here, but it tells you something about certain factions of the emo community. And it tells you something about this band also, which is, now I don't want to do the kind of shallow facile like thing of like, well, if this band has politics that agree with me, then they're automatically good. But these guys are, and girls, are very hardline leftists and this, they're very politically charged they're punks there's no other way to put it they're punks absolutely they imbue the spirit of punk that obviously comes through in the post-hardcore influence and the punk influence and all of those things like the beautiful thing about this record is how progressive it is not just politically but like in the sense of musical progressiveness in the sense of it is a progressive album and the sense they're doing things with structure they're doing things with songwriting they're doing things with basically every tool that they have to be innovating and and that's like what is so like satisfying about this record especially in the context of their discography is they've made three great solid records up to this point where they have really established a sound and a niche that they do really 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 well and they've taken all of that they've revisited all of these little totems that have made up their discography they've amplified all of the best elements and they've introduced so many new twists that it feels like not only a beautiful synthesis of everything that makes this band interesting and fun and exciting but also like a totally new chapter for them as well like some people have described this as kind of like a victory lap sort of final album type of thing and i don't know i mean they say they're not going to break up so i doubt it's going to be their final album but but the thing is to me this feels less like a summation and more like a new chapter that does kind of like bring together things from the past to kind of like you know celebrate and revisit past glories and keep you know people who are, came through for those for that stuff still invested but also to carve out a new direction and say we're we are still the same people and the same band that you loved and we are still going to do certain things that you love that have defined us but we're also going to make it really really different and we're going to do something really really challenging and i think that the record does a, a really great job of easing you into that and then like really like shoving that in your face after a certain point um so like it opens with afraid to die which i've said before that every time i turn this album on and this track starts it just there's something about it the way it starts it just feels like a classic album (laughs) like it just Mm -hmm. opens and it just has the feel of something special uh, immediately and just when those guitar tones ring out at the very beginning and yeah, it's, and- it's one of those intro tracks, which I mean, it is. I feel like that doesn't do it justice, but that is basically just what it is. But it's one of the few intro tracks to ever be like one of my absolute favorites on an album. Mm. And I fucking think riff, man, when that oh, yeah. comes in, it, it, it's enormous. It's 
fucking huge. It's like prog metal. I mean, fuck me. It reminded me of, and serves a kind of similar purpose to um, the opening track on Foxing's new album this year, 737. It's, it's very sort of similar. Near My God was another huge comparison point for me for this. Yeah. I thought of it multiple times. Absolutely. It definitely has shades of Near My God and parts of it as well. Um, but like, and I like the, the new Foxing album. You guys know that I gave it a very positive review and I was very emphatic about it. But I like Af- Afraid to Die, the track is kind of like an even better channeling of and execution of what Foxing did with 737 on the new album and that was a great track too but this is like even better uh, way of introing an album using the same sort of technique of like the slow build and then the explosive guitars and then you're immediately thrown into the next song and it's just an amazing opener and then Queen So for the President one of my most played tracks of the last two weeks this thing just I mean, I'm not going to go through every song because Jay kind of already has, and we still want to hear from Emily and Morgan as well. But I just want to sort of shout out a few different things and like in revisit throughout. But um, the development of Invading the World of the Guilty, uh, Invading the World of the Guilty, yeah, is um, like it starts off like, okay, what is this? This is strange and Menacing. weird. And then as it goes on, it just slowly gets heavier and heavier and heavier. Mm-hmm. And you get those kind of like, uh, it's kind of like that shredding kind of like fretboard Mm -hmm. shit that they do i don't know how it works but like they do that a lot on this album and it always fucking gets me i love that idea of like sort of arpeggiated chords that are just kind of being like you know um instead of playing a single kind of riff you're just kind of like oscillating between notes really really fast and i love the colorful um effect that has like it's so engaging um, and I love when that comes in in this song. And then the second half of this track just gets so fucking heavy and juicy. It's so good. Uh, <laughs> I love that shit. Because this song was a bit of a grower for me initially. Being then, asshole, juicy. This yeah. is a weird podcast. <laughs> hey, it wouldn't be the Jams and Tea podcast if there wasn't the occasional awkward moment where someone makes a really weird innuendo. But anyway. Homoeroticism. Oh yeah, like totally. This is like, yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, there's that. Uh, Died in the prison of the holy office. Great as well. I love how despondent the song is. It, 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 I love the slow build as well. Like the the way the drums are kind of like steadily rising and through the first couple of minutes of the song, and then it just kind of like slams you in the face with, and not in the way you expect either. This is a song that's got weird like. Um, Mon- monotonousness at certain points and I don't mean that in a bad way but like it's a really nihilistic and dark song and it, it has these kind of beautiful building moments that'll just then kind of like fall away into a wall of like confronting it took a decade to flip a broken coin fuck yeah um and it has this like cascading climax where he has that uh that, that kind of really striking line about like um about his therapist telling him to smile and that part always like just jumps yep. out at me um and then Ugh. after that it just kind of like goes and it's just this kind of like monotonous riff and it's like these kind of like harmonized vocals singing and in, in one note like away with god away with love um we are our hands are tied and stepped on i believe and that's just such yeah. a kind of oh deflating into the song but in a good way for me like it, it really like leaves an impact and i like the way that at this point the next kind of few songs kind of like cycle through like a song cycle like it goes into your brain as a rubber maid which isn't even really a song it's kind of just like a continuation of that track and then um the first disc a song that hasn't been talked about yet but i really want to shout out that it finishes with the song trouble the first half and this song oh oh god is so my favorite song that isn't the final two oh my god it's it's so fucking good like i i I, every time this shit hypes me up and i I mean yeah i'll I'll come back to it but i just wanted to shout it out there um and then the last two songs are i mean they're a great album in and of themselves this album yeah I think uh, Ian Cohen of IndieCast, who's a huge emo fan and a huge fan of this band, described this as like two great albums slapped uh-huh. together to make one mega great record. And um, Infinite Josh, which of course the title calls back to both Ultimate Steve from the debut and Infinite Steve, I believe, from yes. Always Foreign. And um, also two calls back with the Josh reference to their one of the early EPs called Josh is Dead, I think. I'm not too familiar with their non-album stuff. But anyway, yeah. this song 
is this is my song of the year infinite josh is my is my song of the year. it's overtaken uh paranol's white ceiling and lucy dacus's triple dog deer both oh, amazing songs wow. that i didn't think would be overtaken but this is overtaken them uh yeah this song i can't get enough of this song it's like the 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 slow build through the first half like not only just the refrain of everyone says you can't go home again that that's some fucking lord of the rings shit and it calls back to the feeling of the beginning it's because when you fucking you get older and you can't go home again and it's like it's that but with youth and god fuck (laughs) and i just love the opening lyrics of this song i mean i think this is a 100 out of 100 song so there's not a a single thing that's remotely imperfect but i love the how evocative this beginning of the song is it had to be memory yeah it had to be 25 or so years ago in my uncle's yard on the back of a motorcycle my mom took a photo she still has i was wearing shorts some t-shirt then i could only guess why i'm seeing stars like that's just so beautiful (sighs) And then the refrain of our dreams get drowned in a river of present needs, which is a, I mean, lyric of the year contender, because (laughs) what a fucking gut punching description of just like growing up. The years float by like fallen leaves. And, and the, the, the way the song builds is unreal. And then the moment about nine minutes in, like where it just kind of stops and then becomes a completely different prog rock song and just an almost even better one somehow. Um, And it doesn't feel disjointed either because, and the reason it doesn't feel disjointed is because they bring everything full circle by the end of the song. Those Mm dueling guitar riffs, like by the end of the track that are just kind of like, first they cycle from one riff to another and then they kind of like play the, the riffs are played together and it's just like, and then the lyrics come back in and it's just ecstatic. I am kind of reserving myself on this a little bit because I'm undeniably going to be talking about it in the best songs of the year video when we do that in December, but Jesus Christ. And then Fewer Afraid, I mean, one thing I want to say on Fewer Afraid is you brought up Godspeed You Black Emperor with that vocal sample. Uh, What I thought of and this will be something that Morgan will recognize, is uh, it reminded me of the vocal sample that opens Mogwai's Young Team, where it's like the, a sample of like a schoolgirl talking about Mogwai's music. And she says like, um, music is bigger than words and wider than pictures. And she just, just says stuff. And I, just the tone of the vocals um, reminded me of that and of the yeah. opening to that record. And it's a very sort of similar song tonally as well to like an early Mogwai track. But it just adds this build and by the time that you get halfway through the song like 10 minutes in and you're having those colorful cascading guitar notes and just these incredible strings that are just kind of like surging it's like they have you have to appreciate how hard it is at this point to do post-rock that doesn't just sound like a cheap imitation of post-rock that's already been done better and I'm not saying it's the best post rock in the world or anything, but it's pretty fucking great. But how hard it is to take a, a genre that has essentially so is, is essentially so limited in, in a lot of ways, and so has such a kind of finite number of iterations where it can still be interesting, and take that and do something like a Godspeed song or do something like a Explosions in the Sky sort of thing and make it feel vital and fresh and powerful and potent. And they do that on both of these last two songs, I think, really, really, really well. And they do it without feeling like they're just stepping into this mode to adopt it, but they actually make it a part of their sound. And because you can still hear the recognizable emo, you can still hear all all of the roots of who this band have always been in all of these songs, even as they are complicated and made different by all of this prog and extra stuff that they're throwing in there and yeah i i'm i'm in awe of this album and i i am so glad that this band were able to make this and that it exists and that we get to talk about it 
this album makes me feel like when I literally first discovered progressive music and I was just like, I didn't have a precedent for it just because that was the first kind of music I gravitated towards. And it was just, it was brain matter expanding. I, I haven't had an experience like it since I discovered fucking porcupine tree. I mean, for fuck's sake, I, how often can you even say that about fucking anything? I mean, God damn, not only does this album just kind of excite me, but it's just like, you know, again, I get to that song, I get back to like blank drone or something. And I'm just like, I feel like I'm, I've already gone through a journey with those first three songs. It just gives me a moment of relief. I'll just sit there and lay in my bed and stare at the ceiling and be like, <sighs> just gives me pause when I need it. Emily, I'd love to hear from you because you're less kind of invested in this band than we are. And so I'd love to hear what your perspective was on, because I essentially just told you, hey, we're reviewing this big emo record thing here and you can review it with us if you want to, since you're going to be on for Little Ugly Main. So I'd love to hear what your experience has been with this band so far and what you make of this album. Uh, my opinion on this album is, uh, it's okay. I, I just wanted to say it like that as the intro because I knew it it would bother me um, yeah, Honestly, I was I was prepared for that. I was just like, I there's no way to even tell. So I'm just going to assume this is probably going to hit in the eh, kind of range. It no, I will, I will say it's better than okay. It's it's pretty good. It's pretty good. But to me, at times, it feels like there are a lot of moments where I feel like it is expanded past the point for me where you bring up infinite josh for that's a great example of some of my issues with this album i know you both love that song for me it feels Tyler, like every, really shriveling i'm sorry but those three parts feel like three great songs that are both extended past their limit and do and would be better as separate songs in my opinion those are how I look at it. Like, I love the refrain of they say you can't go home again. That is repeated so many times in that song that is going to be in my head for the next several weeks. And I respect it, but they probably could have done like one less chorus of it. <laughs> and I don't know. There's a lot of great stuff on here. The track, I got to look up the name of it, but the the worker uh, track, uh, I can't, yeah, Blank can... Worker is right. so good. Like it is incredible. I love Afraid to Die. I like Queen Sophie for President. Uh, the end of We Saw Birds Through the Hole in the Ceiling. I don't remember the beginning of it as well, but that ending where it just sort of collapses in on itself and just becomes this like much more heavy element. It is so good i remember sitting through infinite josh would be like this is good but it's a little over long but you know there's only one track left how long could that last track be <laughs> that's right you know it and it's fucking based i i will say like i like both those tracks but they are both tracks that i feel like like i heard fewer afraid and i like the intro but i felt like at times fewer afraid didn't have the same cosmic energy you mentioned post rock for me that opening like lyric as you mentioned like godspeed you black emperor i feel like it didn't have the same karmic which is not which is a very hard thing to do i will admit that of bringing on that godspeed energy of just like all right we're gonna bring in the spoken word section and we're gonna slowly build and we're gonna hit you like a truck by the end and i didn't feel that as strongly here admittedly that's a really hard thing to compare it to i will fully admit to that and yeah, I don't think it's a bad track at all. I just, I think it's an album that if I return to it after revisiting the band's discography and going through it, I'll, might, I might appreciate it more. It's certainly not a bad album. I really enjoy it. It's better than okay. It's, a, it's by all marks, pretty good. Yeah, it's a, it's a good album. I'll start with the, the negatives. Uh, first and say that I don't think I think the album is pretty clearly cut into thirds and the third that is in between both of the blank tracks uh, doesn't quite measure up for me the the first and final third but also like the album never really puts a foot wrong none of those are bad songs or and like the lowest any of those get in terms of like rating song ratings for me is like seven 
and that the, that's both of the blank tracks in that case so fucking whatever it's just that it feels like there's a bit of a divide between quality in the first and final third and it does kind of make the holistic experience a bit wonky for me that's how that first and final third Woo! Woo! Yeah. yeah that's we your shit right there we do be hollering <laughs> Uh, hooting, hollering, howling, etc. Ice bulging yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. As as infinite, Josh is not even in my top three of the album, and that is fucking stupid. And it, fewer afraid is my uh, favorite on the album and top three of the year. It's just yeah, it, it shit hits. It it hits real good, and the first three tracks on here just dancing between like proper modern progressive rock and like pop emo and then into fucking the best Coheed and Cambria song of the last five years this album is a split EP in parts between Paramore and early Coheed and it's just like yes Let's talk I'm the about curse. our favorite tracks and ratings. Thank you, Fee Bear. Thank you. Fee Bear Bridgers. Fee Bear Bridgers rating distribution is shit. <laughs> <laughs> favorite tracks and ratings then for Illusory Walls. Fee Bear Bridgers gave the Manchester Orchestra album a six. Fucking coward. <laughs> Don't you fucking talk about her like that. <laughs> Emily, why don't you go first? Uh, favorite tracks? I mentioned by far my favorite track is Blank Worker. Like, and I don't mean that as like an insult to the other tracks. It just hits like a truck. It's so good. It's so good. Uh, I really Abolish like... the proletariat. <laughs> oh, God. I... Das Kapital. Uh, I, I, I really enjoyed... Uh, died in the prison of the holy office as well and afraid to die my least favorite track is i'm gonna go with trouble i don't know i don't remember trouble very well and that's kind of why it's my least favorite track because it's the one that i literally cannot remember any of vibrating and uh, my rating is a seven out of ten i'll take it I will say you're really filling in for August in multiple. I ways. was just gonna say. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, okay, it's a good thing. thing. It's a good thing. Here's the thing. I've been pretty positive on like every album we've reviewed up to this yeah. point, outside of Donda, me. where we were all kind of on. So finally, I get to prove I'm not a pushover. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, this is the like, yeah, you've thoroughly proved that in the sense that you have stood up to essentially a wall of hyperbole and said, well, actually. Um, so well <laughs> done. Mean. My three favorite tracks are Infinite Josh, Fewer Afraid, and actually, you know what, just to be different, I'm going to pick three favorite tracks that aren't the last two songs on this record and just say they're implicitly the top two for me. Uh, and so oh. I'll say Trouble, which I guarantee, Emily, if you remembered that track, it wouldn't be your least favorite track. Um, yes. Uh, I'll also say Queen Sophie, Queen Sophie for President and Afraid to Die. Uh, least favorite track. I'd probably, if I had to pick one, it would probably be Blank Worker, but I don't dislike that song. And I definitely I love the sentiment of it. I just feel like the vocal melody gets a little bit repetitive after a while, but that's a very minor quibble. And I'm giving this album a 9.5. My three favorites, uh, Fewer, Afraid, uh, Trouble, and Afraid to Die. Uh, least favorite, I'd probably say Blank Worker, but you know, whatever. That's how I'm feeling a nine. Trouble, trouble, trouble. <laughs> if I stay here, trouble will find me. My three favorite tracks are going to be Infinite Josh, Fewer Afraid, and my favorite song on the album is Trouble. Least favorite song, There Is Not One. Every song is perfect. 
fuck all of you 10 out of 10 album of the year album of every year fucking fucking i don't really dig infinite geos i'm just not a big david foster wallace guy what are you gonna do (laughs) i can't but that book sucks (laughs) <laughs> that's a that's an 8.9 average and right there with fucking roadrunner isn't it yeah and um that leads me to conclude this episode let us know what you think of the world is a beautiful place please I... be nice to me <laughs> please yes. don't hate on me for not liking this album as much as other people did <laughs> i mean i think as jake said earlier like me morgan and and him are kind of just we're we're, people in the world who have heard this album are on this show (laughs) yeah (laughs) some to some extent that's not a huge exaggeration but let us know if you have heard this record what you think of it uh in the comments below and also of course what you think of the little ugly main album as well we want to hear from you we want to hear what you think the best projects from these artists are and what you think as well remember to hit up emily's channel if you have not already, go and watch that new video on the monkeys. Go and watch that new video on here. Go and watch all of Emily's videos because Ooh, Emily monkey. makes uniformly like excellent videos. Around. Thank you. I would, I would, though, I would ar- argue that maybe you don't need to watch some of my earliest videos, but <laughs> not as big a fan of the Now You See Me video anymore. Uh, uh, I enough. will say I am working on some stuff. I want to get another video essay out before the year ends. And I'm obviously working on shorts for Dune and French Dispatch, and I'm going to have one for Last Night in Soho, which means I'm probably going to be dead by the end of the month. So really hit that subscribe button. So it's a much more impressive death. Um, I, I, cause of death, overworking. Um, but no, I'm really excited about the feedback I've gotten on the new video and just how many I don't know. I'm just happy that people are enjoying it. I was really happy to make it and that people are watching my stuff. And I don't know, like I'm, I'm proud of what I do and I'm happy that I'm able to do it. Yeah. Hell yeah. Fucking big ups to that sentiment. Honestly, like we are really happy and proud to be doing what we're doing. We just hit a thousand subscribers the other week and we, I'm so so happy about that that yeah that was a big moment for I think us this it, means i can finally at you when i post about like it, it, it's just it's just cool to see like ads on our videos i never thought i would say that but like it's 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 awesome to see ads on our videos weirdly enough i haven't hit that watch hours point yet so i haven't ah. gotten there yet damn okay well uh, it turns out making tightly edited videos was not the best way of getting well, watch hours we're even then because you have the sub advantage but we have the monetization advantage for all fucking 10 of our regular viewers actually I, to be honest we probably have more than that considering how many, the numbers that the main episodes yeah, always do regularly wrap that at 100 now i think that's about a safe uh, number which is pretty good for um considering that we make multi-hour videos but yeah and if you enjoy the video please give us a like as well. That really matters. Comments also matter, which is why I encourage so much engagement. <laughs> I encourage commenting. It's not just because we're like attention whores. It's because of the, the way the algorithm works, the way that YouTube works is that it doesn't matter what we're doing. It matters what how the, whether people are interacting with it or not. So we, we if you do want it, to interact with people as well. Yeah, we tell do. Tell us we, things we, you want us to review. We will review them. We love getting comments. We love getting suggestions. We love getting everything that the people who watch these videos give us more or less so yeah and make sure you stick around as well because on tuesday we're dropping a fucking epic review of julia holter's aviary which we've already recorded and which was boss as fuck and you don't want to miss that and on thursday as well we have a 1991 retrospective episode on teenage fan clubs bandwagon-esque coming up too you're going to want to see that too next week on the jams and tea podcast we're going to be reviewing the new jpeg mafia album lp and also I didn't even realize that was coming out until i looked at my subscription feed yep, last night right. and i was like oh my I, life's I, about to get really busy too big fan of when artists announce albums days before they drop uh and we're also <laughs> going to be reviewing the new <laughs> the new every time i die album uh which is called a title 
Radical. It's called Radical. We're going to be reviewing that as well. Be so Radical Week. Yeah. I, I can't believe you're reviewing Ratitude. We will not be reviewing Ratitude. Funny Never. stuff. Funny stuff. Um, Sorry, yeah. I just can't stop partying. And that's going to be it for this episode of the Jam Club. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler going full Joker. <laughs> Just going. People need to know why. I'm a man of my word. I'm going to do it. <laughs> I gotta okay. say, like, hey. all right, everyone. And that leaves only one thing left to say. Rock over London. Rock on Chicago. Bounty. The quicker picker upper. Please, please, please. Which is a joke please, because, please. of course, both. Ah!